Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, and also counting for next week, in fact, we welcome back to the show the one and only Christopher Knowles of Secret Sun fame. As maybe some of you are aware, I made sure to have uh, a few weeks in the can for late October and early November because I'm traveling again. The upshot of that is very long days getting a high volume of communications projects completed right on the Mercury Retrograde station. But this isn't a podcast about a girl named Lucky, and I'm certainly not complaining about being forced to have excellent conversations with excellent people before heading off on a long overdue family holiday. It's just that, you know, I need to let you know there were a couple of tech dramas. For the first few minutes, my mic quality is a little poor, thanks to Skype being Skype. We switched to Zoom and it cleared up. But on Chris's side, there is this super faint random beep, like a neighbor's smoke alarm uh, needing new batteries or something. To be honest, I'm kind of into it. It's a bit OG Star Trek, but it's nevertheless there. I'm just mentioning if you hear it, you aren't going crazy because it's one of those sounds that's so faint, you're not sure where it's coming from. I'm letting you know it's in the recording. Uh, Anyway, in both cases, I've done my best to clean it up. Um, None of it's particularly distracting for what is an otherwise amazing mega discussion around the macro subject of writing about magic, how writing is magic, and, you know, generally magic and quote-unquote fiction. That said, it is a discussion through a particular and, I guess, classic Morrison and Moore lens, where we explore in great detail the presentation of magic and similar topics in The Invisibles, obviously, and pro evidence. You all thought I was going to say something else. Uh, In the show notes, you will find links to where you can read both series online in their entirety. So we sort of spoil and sort of don't spoil, but I'm just mentioning the show notes now because if you get halfway through the episode and think, no, I'm going to go and read them uh, and you can do that and and come back and finish later. Uh, This mega episode is more than twice the length of a typical one, so it counts as two weeks worth of shows. Um, So believe me, you've got the time if you want to go and click off and and read the documents we're talking about and then come back and finish the recording. Uh, Anyway, that's the show. Let's do it. Chris Knowles, welcome back. Always great to be here. Oh, I know, I know. And this is going to be this is going to be a super fun chat or, or series of chats because we are talking about how one writes about reality. Yes, we are. And we're picking two very good examples of such. Yes, I think so. And I, I have you to thank for this, because it was a couple of months ago, you were bugging me to, um, to read Providence. And when Chris Knowles bugs you to read something, you should probably read it. And, uh, and, and so I did. And it turns out, it turns out uh, I fully get why. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to it in a minute. But like, I think the impetus for the discussion, um, here we are getting towards the end of 2019 writing about reality definitionally has to include writing about magic because this is a weird way of describing it but magic is real so we talk about realism in quote-unquote fiction as if as if it's some sort of gritty hardened gumshoe on you know on the hunt for a criminal gang or or that sort of procedural drama crap is realism it's not that's fantasy (laughs) fantasy is materialism right uh and and so if we want to talk about who's doing the best kind of writing about reality one of the most important yardsticks we're biased but it seems to me is who gets things like magic uh, the, the most accurate? Do you think that's a reasonable statement? 
Yeah, I do. And it's it's also important to uh, point out that magic is is really um, almost at the root of writing, that, that writing really evolved as a magical form. You know, the art of naming, the art of recording, um, these are all fundamentally magical arts at their core. So I, I think that, you know, to push that forward into the present day, you know, and also look at just how much writing, you know, journalism, and just every kind of writing is all trying to mold reality to your own wishes, which is fundamentally a magical imperative, I think. Yeah, uh, completely, completely. And um, and that's why I think we should... Let me put it this way. So from, from my perspective, it's biased because it's, it's like a, a chaos magic thing, right? Um, the, the defining comic series for kind of getting magic right, um, for me personally, uh, is slash was The Invisibles. And when we're talking about the classic um, baldy, beardy trade-off, which is, of course, for people who are new somehow, who are unaware of these <laughs> cute pet names, we're talking about Alan Moore and Grant Morrison, right? Um, it used to be that... Promethea was the one, was the series, the Alan Moore series that you would sort of hold up to the Invisibles and say, well, who kind of did magic the best? And I'll be honest, I think Grant wins that. Um, Hands down. I, on that on that account, for sure. I, I think Promethea was, was weak tea, to be honest with you. Yeah. And along comes Providence. And, uh, and, and for me, and this is thanks to you, and it's why you actually, you know, bullied me into reading this series. This is the series that we should be holding up to the Invisibles for that kind of perennial, um, baldy, beardy face-off. And, uh, and I think we should probably start with you kind of, because most people, I would assume, who have listened to this uh, podcast for a while are familiar with the Invisibles, but they may not be familiar with Providence. It's worth pointing out that links to both series are in the show notes for people who, um, after our discussion, want to go and explore for themselves, because there will kind of be spoilers, but I'm, I'm hoping we keep the discussion thematic so that people can still uh, enjoy these series if they, if, they haven't, if they haven't got to them. But like, it might be worth you sort of describing or situating Providence in, in the context of Alan Moore's Lovecraftian work, and then sort of giving us a brief rundown of, of, of what it even am. Yeah, well, Alan Moore um, famously had worked for DC in this in the eighties. Uh, he had come over with what was called the, the British Invasion of Comics, um, and uh, he had was the first one to really make a mark a, as a writer with uh, Swamp Thing. And Swamp Thing was a really kind of revolutionary book, and and I think it you know it showed that he was sort of a nascent uh, magician in development i he always sort of protests that he just woke up one morning when he turned 40 and decided to be a magician I, I think he was you know moving in that direction fairly evidently for quite some time but um he you know he famously did the watchmen and he had a, a huge blowout with dc about it because the 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 deal was is that the rights would revert to him when the book went out of print and of course, the book is still very much in print and is still, you know, atop the graphic novel bestseller lists on a regular basis. So um, he felt uh, ripped off by that. And he also felt, you know, he wasn't be get, given a cut of uh, merchandising. They were making a lot of T-shirts and, and buttons and bumper stickers and all these kind of tchotchkes that were capitalizing on the book. So he um, really dipped out uh, of comics, did a lot of indie work. And then he sort of got his toes back in the water in the early 90s, uh, working for um, a guy named Rob Liefeld, who was uh, a Marvel artist who went on to form an independent company called Image. So he was sort of building back up to doing uh, comics work again. And he was also very alienated from the sort of dark and gritty style of comics that you know, was ostensibly taking off from the Watchmen. But he was also doing things like From Hell, which I think is a very deliberately and specifically uh, magical text that I, I think that you can pair very nicely with Providence, even though I think Providence is a lot more interesting, personally. But then he did some, um, he did some superhero titles in the late 90s uh, for a company called Wildstorm, and then they sold out to DC, and he sort of dipped out again. So he started working for a company which is really sort of like a, I call them a horror porn company, this company called Avatar that sort of made their name in like the horror boom 
I guess maybe in the late nineties, early two thousands, um, you know, can, I, I, they have, they have sort of a shady reputation. I don't know if it's deserved, but they, they have published a lot of very questionable material, very, um, you know, explicit horror, torture porn kind of material. And somehow he hooked up with them. And, and one of the uh, first projects he did with them was, uh, some of these, uh, his Lovecraft stories, which were adapted for comics. And um, one of them was a, a two-issue book called the, the Courtyard, and this was based on a, 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 a prose story that he had written for a, a Lovecraft anthology. And it was adapted uh, into a two-issue book, black and white, and it sort of started a ball rolling. It was, you know, it was very well received, um, even though it's a very short story. But it's sort of focused on the whole idea of, you know, language as being a form of magic and, and language having a, almost like a hallucinatory effect, having an effect of, of, of altering reality um, and uh, sort of transforming a, a, an FBI agent into uh, a serial killer. And this was followed uh, by a four-issue uh, miniseries called Neonomicon. And the, the impetus behind this series is very interesting because it really was because... Um, he owed a lot of taxes to the government, to Her Majesty, and uh, needed to raise some money very quickly. So he signed a deal, w again, with Avatar Press to do this uh, four-issue miniseries. And, and my, my very strong opinion is that um, the basis of this series was uh, you know, not only the obvious Lovecraft material and references that, that he weaves throughout but i i very get the very strong feeling that this was a um a rejected x-files pitch that he had submitted uh because you know we had people like um william gibson and stephen king got a couple of stories uh adapted for the x-files and i think he was kind of trying to his hand at that because if you look at the characters in neonomicon um they pretty much directly line up with uh you know main characters in x-files but um it was a very uh, controversial book because uh, Alan Moore's got like a rape thing going on. Um, <laughs> it's a little disturbing. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the impetus behind that is, but um, there's uh, a lot of very brutal rape scenes in this uh, Neonomicon, and it's sort of these uh, uh, amphibious characters, uh, you know, remarkably similar to The Shape of Water, you know, strangely enough. But, you know, there's, they're meant to be like um, uh, descendants of the old ones or sort of offspring of the old ones. And uh, th this woman, uh, this FBI agent named uh, Meryl Breers is um, kidnapped by this cult in Salem, Massachusetts, operating out of one of these kind of witch stores that are all over the place in that town. And um, she's, you know, basically a sex slave to this uh, reptilian uh, monster. And, um, you know, it sounds very brutal and, and it sounds very uh, pulpy and kind of classless, but it's actually much better than it sounds. Um, even though it is, it, there is a lot of brutal violence and, and of course, the, the, the rape scenes and so on and so forth. But um, that led to this 12 issue deluxe miniseries called Providence. And. Uh, before we start describing Providence, I do just want to jump in. And I mean, you've just described this, right? But it is important for where we go with this conversation to really underline that Alan's Lovecraft foo is strong. Like he has Lovecraft game. Oh, yeah. He's obviously very, very deeply invested in, in, in the work. So I, I, my personal belief, and, and I think, you know, events have kind of borne it out, is that he intended Providence to be sort of his valedictory message to the comics world that, you know, he's, he's getting ready to duck out. I mean, I think he did. Afterwards, there was a, another League of Extraordinary Gentlemen uh, volume. But, you know, it's pretty clear that his heart wasn't really in that, that project anymore. And I don't think it has been for a while. So I, and, and, you know, who knows when he even wrote it. So I, I think that Providence was really sort of his, his farewell and that, you know, what he wanted to leave the medium uh, having to say, you know, what kind of statement he wanted to make. And I, I think if you read Providence, it, it's very clear that, you know, there's so many strands and themes in his work. Um, that seemed to be leading up to it in, in a very interesting way. So the, the story, the basic story itself is that a, um, a writer, a, a New York-based writer, um, 
goes to New England, goes to the wilds of New England in the early part of the 20th century, I think, believe in the 1920s, and um, travels around uh, sort of searching for uh, folk, folk magic that, that he's heard of, that he's heard rumors of, and uh, that, that he believes uh, Lovecraft is, is kind of tapping into, that, that, that the, the stories that Lovecraft are, is writing are actually based on, on real life events. And he, he wanders around, he goes from Salem uh, out to the New Hampshire and you know, around Western Massachusetts, which really at, at that point in time were, were pretty unsettled. I mean, that was pretty wild territory. It was, the, it was the boondocks, it was the backwoods. In some ways it still is. And he um, basically goes through the, uh, the canon, you know, sort of the um, pantheon of, of star Lovecraft characters. Um, more um, changes their names, uh, changes some of their stories, but has his character, has his protagonist, you know, basically interacting with a bunch of, uh, you know, like Herbert West and uh, Asnath Wade and, and all these different characters from well-known uh, more uh, Lovecraft books, he, he interacts with and, and kind of almost like, <laughs> I would almost say like LARPs, uh, the stories that, that the Lovecraft had um, been writing and eventually ends up in, in Providence, you know, hence the, the title of the, uh, the book and um, interacts with, with Lovecraft himself. And Lovecraft is younger and he's very eccentric, and he's, um, you know, as we know, he's uh, blithely racist and, and chauvinistic and um, rather unpleasant, um, but, you know, also very ingratiating in many ways and um, eccentric and, and talks in, in archaic uh, English forms, you know, sees himself as a, as a you know, 19th or 18th century gentleman. And um, you know the story sort of precedes them there. We can get you know more into the yeah, detail. Yeah, yeah. It's I actually I really love the the inclusion of Lovecraft. It's probably one of the first uh, areas of comparison. I'll I'll do a brief couple of sentence Invisibles just so that we've sort of done the same thing, right? Which is essentially a group of um, magic using activists who uh, are part of a much longer sort of legacy of groups fighting as the archons or, or tyranny or, or whatever um, engage in this sort of multi-continent battle with alien demon things and, and it's all kind of metaphors for tyranny and, and, and power and so on. But one of the things that I think Alan does better in this, and it's a bit unfair because like Grant was much younger when he wrote Invisibles, but both of them have done the the comic equivalent of the play within the play, like uh, Grant's sort of interested in in how you weave the reality. And it, it's done, I, I mean, I don't like Gideon Stargrave. I think it's dull um, as, as a character, but he does that kind of, well, what is, what's a character in a comic and, and how do they exist in reality? Thing. You see the beginning of his interest in it in Invisibles. The better one is Flex Mentalo, still not that great, but the inclusion of the whole kind of thing about Providence is the story is, is story and reality and, and where they interrelate. And it's really cute when it comes to Lovecraft because Alan has the opportunity to wink at the, the gross things about the personage of Lovecraft being homophobic and anti-Semitic and racist and whatever, and, and kind of has his lead character not really kind of realizing mm, that's a bit of a bum note. And I thought that was quite delightful. But I think the, the competence of how you handle these sort of very Western categories of, of fiction versus uh, nonfiction and, and versus reality, uh, it's, it's definitely handled with more deftness uh, in, in Providence. And, and part of that is an age difference. Like um, Grant was very young when Invisibles came out, and it's, it's decades later when uh, Providence does. But by the same token, I think Alan kind of wins on the blending of, of, uh, of fiction and reality. Well, I think... You know, The Invisibles is a very 90s work. You know, it's very druggy and horny and pop mad and fashion conscious and uh, hyperactive and, you know, ADD, short attention span, jumping from one theme to the next. I mean, it's very much a product of its time. And, and by the same token, I, I think the Providence is, is very much, um, you know, a product of its time. It's, it's a product of this sort of early... 21st century malaise and exhaustion and just uh, pessimism 
and fatalism, I think, you know, sort of the hallmarks of that. I, I, it's interesting in some ways because if you really wanted to go, you know, apples to apples, oranges to oranges, you can't really compare these two books. I, I think that the closest analog for Invisibles, I think, would be Watchmen. I think that Watchmen yeah, would be the closest, um, you know, mirror image uh, as, as much as they can be with these two very different writers. Um, that that you know there's the same a lot of the same themes there's a lot of jumping around the timeline there's a lot of issues you know like you said about lineage uh, about tradition about received tradition uh about secret packs and 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 oligarchs with mad plans of dealing with interdimensional terrors i mean there are a lot of similarities and a lot of themes that you can kind of you know do a, a, a bit of tw a twinning with with the two works um uh watchmen is a very 80s work just as much as the invisibles is a very 90s work uh, the watchmen is very much a product of you know sort of the tail end of uh baby boomer uh optimism baby boomer you know change the world aquarian mentality uh sort of collapsing in on itself and admitting defeat which was you know very much a a, a very current theme at that time you know it was very much you know the whole you know the yippies become the yuppies and and put on three-piece suits and join the system and i think that since you know grant's several years younger um comes from a different mindset comes from a different subculture because subcultures were moving so rapidly uh you know they're cycling in and out at such a pace back in in britain in the 70s and the 80s i mean you know the difference might as well be just you know multi-generational so i think that you know the grants uh, approach is much different and it's it's much more um autobiographical autobiographical and you know fantasy fulfillment I, I you know so much of of the invisibles to me is um you know a really horny really enthusiastic hyperactive guy kind of you know shoving his dick into the world you know what i'm saying it's mm. like he's just really you can just feel the sexual energy and the amphetamines and the you know the adrenaline in that book it's 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 a much different field than than i don't, I don't think alan moore has ever done anything quite like that and and moore's work you know to be you know, perfectly frank, until he sort of had this magical reawakening and did a lot of, you know, very fun and joyous work in the late 90s. I um, mean, his work was, you know, it was always very pessimistic. It was always very dour. It was always very earnest. Uh, you know, even in his approach to the supernatural, even in his approach to magic, it was, it was not something you, you read for fun you know you and there was enjoyment in the reading but it wasn't necessarily fun to read and i'm not exactly sure that that providence is fun to read you know as 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 easy invisibles is fun to read you know the no, I'd, I'd, fun I, would, to read. I would just come out and say no and and a big part of that and i get why this is because alan's like he would criticize himself at the beginning that Watchmen is overstructured, but he is really good at structure. Like this one, this one is structured in a in a deft way. But holy shit, the um, the actual commonplace book components to it. So for people structurally, it's it's a graphic novel for people who haven't read it yet. Again, it's in the show notes. Um, but there are big chunks of it because it is exploring the whole kind of archetypal shape of a Lovecraft story, a diary entries. And oh my yes. God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we both skimmed them. Well, I mean, you, yeah. you have to read them, but like there, it, this is, comes back to your point that there is pleasure in the reading, but it's not, it's not this bright zippy action packed um, MTV uh, invisibles kind of pace that it's, it is uh, it's, early 20th century, yeah, Northeast, complete with, uh, 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 oh, God save us, like a, a self-obsessed obsessed writer's fucking diary. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and he nails that quite well to, to your kind of detriment, the wrong word. He nails that despite the fact that it is impacting your reading pleasure. And, I mean, that's a, that's a sign of a confident creator. But, yeah, it's definitely not as much, quote, unquote, fun to read as The Invisibles. Well, I'll tell you the fun in Providence for me is that 
and I, it's again it's not sort of like a, a party kind of fun but the pleasure more than the fun and the satisfaction you get from reading providence is you are getting a much closer mirror of magical reality you know as as it exists in in meat space and consensus reality mm. uh, then you know obviously sort of the hallucinatory you know very 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 comic book uh adventures of of the invisibles and you know, I, you know it's funny because the invisibles was not all that much of a departure from a lot of the comics that you saw in the 70s because a lot of the comics that you saw in the 70s were written by guys who were like serious acid heads um you know the whole idea of cosmic uh you know dimensions and 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 traveling in between timelines all these kind of things i mean you had a lot of writers like steve engelhart and jim starlin <clears throat> and people like that uh, david anthony craft who were, were very much you know of that same ilk, that same mentality. And I, I think that, you know, Morrison adds a very British, uh, a more transgressive, you know, a little bit more of a Generation X flavor to, to the storytelling. But, you know, it is not all that much different than a lot of things that you would, you'd read in the 70s. Um, and, you know, people like Steve Engelhart, you know, were practicing magicians. And, mm. um, you know, a lot of people, I, I, I was interviewing uh, somebody. Uh, it might have been Jim Starlin, but telling me how, um, you know, a lot of these young guys that, who started working for Marvel, you know, came in from the hippie generation. Basically, what they would do is that they would just like drop mega doses of acid and they would just like wander around New York City at night, which like in the 70s seems like, you know, not the best tripping atmosphere that, you you know, there's a whole thing of, you know, set and setting. I don't think that that was a very conducive setting to uh, good trips, but I think that sort of, you know, they were trying to blow their minds open and, and, you know, that's probably a good way to do it. So I think that Morrison was very much following in, in a lineage that had been established. Uh, you know, again, people like Doug Mensch as well. I mean, Doug Mensch is somebody who I met out at Esalen and, and he was doing a lot of this kind of stuff. You know, he was a real dyed in the world Detroit hippie, you know, sort of the ass kicking hippie lineage. So uh, Morrison was, was much more, um, detail oriented and again he had that fashion sense he had the pop sense you know he had sort of that swing london mentality uh ironically for a scott but it was very much a lineage and and also i mean more too as well i mean one of the things that that, that troubles me uh and maybe irks me is that people sort of assume that you know nobody was doing stories about magic uh, or the occult in comics um you know, Joe. Sh uh, I'm sorry, Jerry Siegel, who invented Superman, was very interested in the occult and did a number of stories. I mean, he didn't. You know, the Spectre, who some people might have heard of, is is a uh, character that he invented in in the uh, early '40s that was you know very occult oriented, and he clearly knew his stuff. If you read a lot of Jerry Siegel's stories, he he knows what he's talking about. He's well read. So this is a lineage that I think is is, is baked into the medium, and I think what Moore and Morrison did so well is that they they drew attention to it you know um they they packaged it more effectively than i think it had been before and by doing so they were able to sort of shift that consciousness you know they were, they were moving the needle so you know they were moving the needle along and changing people's consciousness and make, making people more aware of the process of of magic and writing you know it's funny when i was refreshing myself on the invisibles in the lead up to this chat it kind of occurred to me because we're going to lead up to who describes i guess magic better once we sort of talk about things like name and place and so on there is something about the invisibles like um both of them packaged it correctly but in, in the case of the invisibles and i know i like it uh, and it, I, it's it's sort of been a companion of mine for some time now uh i think Al, uh, Al, I think Grant had to describe this. I think he set out to write a comic that was smaller than the one he ended up with. And it's almost like a weird channeling situation, like catching the end of the millennium current, because there are moments where you see, and it, it frankly, it ends with a, a really shitty philosophy um, 
like a really limited or, or a human philosophy, like Grant's like, well, maybe we invented the gods as our prisoners and, and like our job is to, um, like a true free person gets past that. And you go, really? What are you, 16? Uh, like, how do, you, how do you end The Invisibles, which has got aliens and underground bases and, and um, ancient Aztec gods and, and all this stuff, and then you end with, like, maybe the good guys and the bad guys are the same and, it, and we just invent our own gods and prisoners and we should move past it. Like, it's weird. It, it's almost like there, there's the, the human ending this moment but he essentially channeled something bigger than uh that he actually could describe as a person at that age because there are moments where the sort of bum notes feel human but then the rest of it just crazy like i mean we'll get to it in a minute but reading back through it i'm like oh look he basically in the 90s has a very chris knowles understanding of what happened at roswell you think hang on a minute <laughs> that's not bad <laughs> and then he ends with like maybe we made all this stuff up and we should be free and you think hang on no there's something there's a jarring there where he's done that by virtue of performance and and just the creative act he has caught a current that is bigger than his own kind of philosophy could compose i guess do you know what i mean does that make sense yeah it does make sense but you know i think we should look, go back to the beginning of the series and, and kind of look at where it starts and then sort of takes off like you know on this rocket ride because it does start small it does start as like almost a um conventional almost like a, an arthurian story you know because you have this uh like arthur mm -hmm. type archetype who meets his Merlin and they sort of wander around and Merlin shows him the ropes and it is a very small and it's a very conventional narrative. It's, ultra, it's, it's, it's almost like he'd um, glimpsed at Hero with a Thousand Faces or something because even before we're talking about when Dane meets old Tom in London in the, in the first episode but at the very beginning of it um, he encounters either the ghosts of a couple of the Beatles in Liverpool, or he has a kind of slipping through time moment where he's um, a few decades back in Liverpool and they're in their Hamburg phase. Um, and so it opens with this high, strange encounter and then an archon. So it's literally as, as quintessentially hero with a thousand faces as you could possibly want to the point of being boring or Arthurian, as you say, it's like, here's a kid who is touched by destiny as a child and then gets given a Merlin. It, it actually does start as, yeah, as conventional as it could be. And, you know, and what it reminds me of in there is those early issues. And, and I hate to say this because, you know, first of all, I don't want to offend anyone of this particular writer's fans, but also I don't want to offend um, Grant Morrison fans, but it, it reminds me of um, Neil Gaiman did a, a BBC series that became a graphic mm, novel called yeah. Neverwhere. Yes. Yeah. And it was, I remember I bought the entire series when it, when it was published and I think I enjoyed it. It might've been because the art was very good, but it's just a very standard kind of, Oh, you don't realize it, but there's this whole secret world, you know, in your midst, and somehow you sort of fall into it, and it and it changes your life, and you know, which is fine, but it's not exactly the most compelling narrative that you can pull out of the ether. Um, I think that Invisibles very much starts in that that vein and gets a lot more interesting as it goes along. Yeah, and this this would map to my sort of contention that which which happens with all good creative stuff, right? Like that it 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 should get away from you in in some way. I guess that's a difference. Like I, it, Alan's clearly thought, and, I, and this comes through in Providence. I don't think Providence gets away from him. I think he says exactly what he wants to say in that. But what he wants to say in that is that the creative and the imaginal can get away from you. So it's weird. Like it, it's almost like the Invisibles is an example of it. Uh, and uh, and I could make the case in Providence that that's actually what Alan's saying, which is that the the act of creation and and the the ontology of the imaginal is is um, is undeniable and can change or destroy the world. Well, you know, on a, on a functional level, that's a, a difference between the two writers. I mean, Alan Moore is famous for writing like three pages, you know, to describe a matchbook in a gutter. You know, um, he 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 plans everything out meticulously, and he make sure that everything is 
where it should be well ahead of time before you know the penciler even hits the page i i get the feeling very much with invisibles that it was very spontaneous and it was very seat of the pants and you know, he might have had an idea of what he wanted to incorporate but i think he it was an adventure it was just sort of like well let me just let myself go and see where this ends up and that end that you talk about Again, if you put it in the context, I mean, one of the problems with The Invisibles is that it really never found a large audience. It, you know, it never really, as far as I remember, I, it always seemed to be selling in like the 20K range, you know, which would be a, a, a hit, you know, these days. But at, at that point in time, you know, didn't really sustain itself to Grant Morrison sales levels. I mean, he was doing Justice League at the same time, and I believe it was selling like 100,000, 150,000, somewhere in that range. You know, I'm sure that DC editors weren't really that crazy about him spending his time on this book that a lot of people didn't really understand too well because it is so esoteric and it is so detailed. Um, so I think that, that that ending where it just sort of putters to the stop um, sort of speaks to his mindset that he, I think that he was frustrated in a lot of ways that people weren't willing to come on this rocket ride with him. Okay. All the, right. I like that. That, um, you know what I mean? That yeah, and cool. he was trying to like create like this valedictory message, you know, this, uh, this benediction because not soon, uh, you know, not long after he finished, uh, the invisibles, he, he went over to Marvel and started just, you know, writing a lot of superhero titles. So, and that's what he did for the next several years. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I, I believe that there was there might have been a lot of frustration uh, with this book because don't forget that it was canceled twice. Um, you know, the, the, it was the first run, and then it was canceled, and then it was rebooted. Uh, so it started in 1994, and then um, was rebooted in 1997, and then uh, rebooted again in 1999. All my favorite things are canceled twice. Futurama was canceled twice. It's uh, it, and it, it does it, it. The story's uneven because of it, and I like that. I like that the, the sort of last volume. They're all older and and like the Invisible Kingdom stuff is. You know, that's yeah. The Invisible Kingdom's the last one. That's fine. But, um, it's just the ending. Now I'm going to have to think about what you said about the ending. You're probably right there, which is a yeah. I like it. It's cool. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> <clears throat> but but I think before we get too too much farther into the book, we should sort of just cover like what basically the book is about. <laughs> I don't think we, I don't think we we uh, covered that yet. So the, it's basically a, a very esoteric uh, superhero team and superhero team that aren't necessarily super powered, but uh, it's a team of you know what I, I basically think are um, you know Grant Grant Morrison's personal fantasies uh assembled you know to fight the uh this conspiracy uh of aristocrats who are in league with uh what are basically time demons i, I think would probably be the best term do you, do you like that time i demons? do i think i think his understanding of time and exploration of it is the best thing about the invisibles and i do believe that's um, a, a side effect of you know whatever happened to him in Nepal with those drugs and and whatever. I think there's a, my, one of my favorite lines in it is that Lady Edith line towards the end where she's like, um, "Time can be tricky. One false move and then suddenly you're a hundred. Um, it's just uh, time in the Invisibles is the thing, and and he does it so well. Well, there's always uh, when when they see aliens or UFOs or whatever, you know, someone will say, "Oh, you know, those are from space," and they'll always be corrected. No, they're from time. You know, they're out of time. They're not out of space. Uh, I, I think they're. Somebody said space buggers, and and then he's corrected and said, "No, it's, they're time buggers." So I, I think that uh, you know that's a very important aspect of the story that you know is, is probably overlooked. Um, by yeah. some, you know, certainly yeah. not by yourself. But um, so we have a sort of, you know, the character that we talk about, who's sort of the King Arthur character, who's, I guess, supposed to be the next Buddha, who is this uh, Liverpudlian uh, scouse, I guess you would say, uh, sort of street punk, uh, you know, very much of the 90s uh, with the anorak and the, you know, the bowl the cut part is, yeah, yeah. And the, and the bowl cut part in the middle. And, um, you know, I, 
I think so. If I look at the, these these characters archetypally and and what they mean to Grant Morrison, you know, my definition and my explanation, you know, might be different than yours. But so I see Jack Frost, who is this Scouse boy, as uh, you know, Grant's fantasy of himself as a teen. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, maybe fantasies that he he had of himself as a teen as being sort of this man of you know future man of destiny. And then King Mob is an interesting character because King Mob really looks like Grant Morrison. He just has more piercings. Um, so he's a, a professional assassin who assembles this team to, uh, you know, at the Invisibles, which is really uh, a secret society that, that dates back in time. And this is the latest iteration of them. And uh, King Mob is the leader. And um, it's, it's really interesting to see how, you know, throughout the, the course of this series, how... King Mob and, and Grant Morrison, or King Mob the character and Grant Morrison the the, the fictional character uh, that existed in, in real real time, um, really fed into each other and 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 fed you know in and out of each other. I remember seeing Grant Morrison at a, at a, con- a San Diego convention, and he walks in and he's wearing uh, you know he's got the shaved head and he's wearing this like uh, full length black leather um, trench coat and he's got this. You know, very rather extravagant-looking woman who is extraordinarily busty and uh, is wearing this huge black dress and has this, you know, dyed scarlet hair. I mean, they they really cut quite a couple of figures walking through. You know, this mass of <laughs> fanboy <laughs> fanboy protoplasm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, they really stood out. And I, I think he was he was very canny at at marketing himself and, and marketing you know the Grant Morrison character. Uh, a lot of people would be familiar that he was um, associated with uh, Richard Metzger when he was running disinformation, and disinformation was kind of like this clearinghouse for uh, pop occultism and conspiracy theory and all these kind of things. And they, they put out a number of books. And, and later, they became a website that was uh, run to the ground. <laughs> <when they were. laughs> to God knows who. But anyway, um, so then there's a, a Brazilian uh, transgender woman named Fanny. And, uh, you know, I believe this is probably based on uh, Grant Morrison's favorite porn genre, like, because this has popped up in, in, the, in the filth as well. The, uh, the, the quasi uh, sequel to, um, to The Invisibles. Um, it's also something he briefly experimented with. Not trans, not being trans, but like um, cross-dressing and so on in, when he was in Soho. Not that often, but he had a couple of months there of hitting up the gay bars in drag, um, which he, he talks about himself. But it's funny, like, I, I want to jump in there because one of the things that's aged it is um, Alan's name game, as we were talking before we hit record, is so much better. But like Lord Fanny, you wouldn't name in the 90s because no one was writing comics about trans people or whatever you, his heart's in the right place but it's funny that it's it's clunky to the point of insensitive in the same way the, the sort of voodoo character named jim crow like uh, a white scottish man a heterosexual white scottish man probably wouldn't make those creative choices <laughs> in 2019 and it's interesting to see that in a difference to say lovecraft where it's aged horribly it's tarnished a bit but you can kind of give grant the benefit of the doubt like no your heart was in the right place you were you were trying to explore actual things that were um that were important and and not spoken of but you you mentioned lord fanny there and i'm like we should jump in (laughs) and go it's really interesting reading through it now and going this isn't exactly the the um the cutting edge of progressivism in 2019 i guess well yeah but it was sort of daring Oh, absolutely. You know, in and of the time. But, yeah. you know, it's funny because, like, it, it reminds me of when the X-Files would always try to do, like, different cultures. Uh, they always just, it was always so club-footed and earnest to the point of, of being very cringy and, and, and it, well, yeah, that, inadvertently insulting. You when know, I was uh, in film school, which was like the end of the 90s, beginning of the noughties, um, I remember distinctly an article um, that we were given in class, which is why there are so many magical black characters in Hollywood films. And it's essentially that. It's essentially that they're written by white people who don't have the, <laughs> the experience of black culture. And the easiest thing to do when you want to include other cultures is to make them magical so that you don't actually have to like Engage with them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so there's this whole thing about why there's so many magical black characters, particularly in the last 20 years of the 20th century, um, Green Mile type stuff. There's all these magical black characters in films written by white people. And, and 
I, I, I would say, I would actually say that Jim Crow and Lord Fanny are much better versions of that, but they are nevertheless like kind of a thing that happened at the time. Hard in the right place, we would do it differently now. Yeah, they weren't they weren't meant to be offensive or degrading or demeaning. Yeah, um, you know, and then there's a boy who's the um, androgynous uh, black female former cop. Um, you know, she's not given a, a tremendously compelling story. I think her backstory is interesting. Um, you know, if if you ask me to name the most memorable story in this series for me it would be uh volume one number 20 which is a story called howard became invisible and it's basically you know her origin story and uh a very chilling story and and really fascinating and, and very different not of the same piece as the rest of the series but you know it's almost like a standalone that i think is you know really effective but um he sort of gave this very contrived uh romance between the you know the young scouse boy and this uh, older you know this much older uh female black cop from new york that i don't know if they'd even be able to speak to each other in real life like you know i, I just there would be not out of any sense of hostility but i just don't think there would be any points of reference between these two characters at all in the real world of course you know this isn't the real world but then there's also uh King Mob, who is the the grand character, has um, a girlfriend called Ragged Robin, and he he had claimed that it was based on Raggedy Andy. But if uh, you look at the way she's drawn, uh, there's an artist who actually drew a few issues of the series called Jill Thompson, who seemed to be sort of the muse for a lot of these uh, '90s uh, edgy boy comic artists. She seemed to be, uh, I you know, I, I knew Jill Thompson. I actually, spent a very interesting night. Uh, san diego on a on a pub crawl with her and her husband a guy named brian nazarello who, who writes a lot for dc but she seemed to be sort of a muse for a lot of people like grant so it's it's, it's just very clear that maybe he had a crush on her at some point so he made made her his, his girlfriend you know his, his alter ego's uh a girlfriend in this uh in this book and then there's um so that's the that's the core of the team and the sort of characters that that float in out of it um you know various supporting characters uh you know the two the two most important ones i guess would be um mason lang who i guess would be sort of almost like a bruce wayne character and um he's like the impossibly rich character who's you know is impossibly generous with his money and is willing to bankroll whatever these occult superheroes need you know it's very much a fantasy uh, you know every occultist wish he had a, a patron that would just write all his checks for him and then uh the the primary villain so that's the team he's sort of the uh you know that's that's a very kind of well-known archetype you know the the, the patron the the money man and the sugar daddy and it's funny right like this is an example of i think grant accidentally writing reality correctly because mason lang and this the investments he makes in that japanese scientist takashi and, and time travel he's he's accidentally describing silicon valley before it was i mean it existed and it's been around since the 70s as a, as a place of technological innovation but not the silicon valley we know today right um, yeah he's kind of like elon musk isn't he yeah because it's, it it's, looks it's like a, him <laughs> it's a billionaire. It's a. It's like a benign Elon Musk or a, a sort of good guy, um, I investing his money in the kind of stuff that um, the edges of Silicon Valley invest in now. And arguably, if we if we read Jacques Vallée's fiction the way I think we should, probably has gone on like quite literally things like um, trans temporal technology stuff um and, and that's funny like he didn't it's an example of him getting things like with the underground bases and and all of that kind of stuff that grant just sort of swinging for the fences kind of got right well ironically another person who's a, a real life analog to mason lang would be jeffrey epstein you know who yeah, is, true. uh you know it's very interesting since epstein got arrested and um got dead uh let's just say uh, i've noticed that a lot of the real kind of crazy science stories that you're reading you know like uh, a lot of these transhumanist and crispr and you know just the real sci-fi comic book stuff that was really uh hitting the, the science websites 
very hard. You know, the science headlines were getting really, really kind of crazy uh, for a couple of years there. And then when you read the same websites now, it's deadly dull. So I really wonder how much of, uh, of Epstein's money was just driving a lot of this just like crazy off the wall comic book pseudoscience, really, you know, I think in the long run. I mean, I know people have been always very real scientists have been skeptical of uh, transhumanism for, you know, since the beginning. Yeah. But, Transhumanism um, is over, and that's either good news or bad news. In the sense that it's, in a very invisible sense, it's a game board that's being packed up because they've got what they wanted. Or, more likely, what it looks like at the very top doesn't look like um, the Epstein level of these people are stupid enough to believe that they're going to. Like we were talking about this the other day. Like apparently, he wanted to have his head and his penis preserved. Like uh, you are a child. <laughs> You, you're actually, your cosmology is the stupid, I'm, I'm glad you're dead. Like, do you, uh, and he, he was funding science, so there are scientists out there who are going to nod along seriously to like, you can live forever, all we need is your head and your dick. What yeah. the fuck? <laughs> yeah, he was uh, a very sick man, um, but I think he's emblematic of his entire social milieu i think they're all sick in the head i think they all have bizarre fantasies uh they have too much money that they they haven't really earned and they don't know what to do with and i think that's basically the story of uh late capitalism as we know it um but uh you know as far as grant sort of make it up as you go along seat of the pants uh energy uh at some point in the second series um there are these three characters uh called division x who you know are clearly modeled on the old uh, British spy thriller TV show uh, Department S, um, you know, visually modeled on them, you know, quite clearly, uh, and the star of which was um, Peter Wingard. Who, if um, anybody ever gets the chance, if you really want to see a great magical narrative uh, in cinema. Um, there's a book, uh, a film, sorry, called uh, Burn Witch Burn, aka Nighty the Eagle, uh, that, that Peter Wingard stars in, and it is a phenomenal movie that everyone, if you haven't seen it, and you're interested in magic, you're interested in magic in popular culture, just drop everything, like stop listening to this podcast and go watch it, and then come back because it's just it's that. To me, it's that foundational. It's just a, it's a, it's a must see. It's a phenomenal movie, and it's really very. It's remarkably <laughs> um, uh, relevant today. It's remarkably current because it's about the whole, you know, the dialectic between science and and magic, and how science is is much more reliant on magic uh, than it would ever want to ever believe it is it's just uh, uh oh I, I can't say enough about this movie it's just phenomenal but uh peter wingard was actually uh um he was uh romantically linked to alan bates of uh the you know who's been in a million things but was also the uh, john keel character in mothman prophecies which uh, i think has yeah. a lot of um a lot of thematic overlaps with the invisibles i i think that the two um sit nicely together on your your shelf of geek uh, the mothman prophecies if, if if you haven't seen the movie that's another it's just vastly underrated and, and one of the things i'll jump in there that i would suggest people do is buy the dvd secondhand uh, of amazon if you still have a device that can play dvds because it had a whole bunch of really good Forty and extras um, that, that came along with it the, the film itself is great and obviously the book is but um well, the book that it's based on or the work that it's based on, but the actual DVD when it came out had like all these extra features that are for people who listen to this kind of show worth, uh, worth the one cent or whatever a secondhand DVD is on Amazon now. Yeah, I, I concur. Um, and it's uh, this, if you do a little research, do a little searching on the net, there were some very um, tragic after effects of, of that film. Um, you know, which is, uh, it, I, I believe, you know, it is a work of magic in and of itself and um, unfortunately had some uh, unpleasant blowback for a lot of people uh, who worked on it. But I think that just speaks to, you know, the power of, of the, the, the basic narrative and, and also the, the veracity of the basic narrative. I, you know, there's always been a lot of 
debate going back and forth about the book and how Keel was just blowing smoke and he was just, you know, a sensationalist. Uh, and I, I think if you really look into his history, I don't, I don't think that. I don't like think he was a sensationalist, but that doesn't mean it was a lie. You know, it, it's it, there's a difference. That he wrote in a certain and very distinct way, which I find quite enjoyable, but that's it's different to saying he made it up. And and it's weird we, because of the, the documents under discussion for this show, we can make the, the sort of retroactive case that the incidents that occurred surrounding the film are evidence that there was an actual phenomenon that he was documenting in his book because look at these effects. And we, you kind of move into that world of, of, uh, of, of, retroactive spirit evidence based on uh, like if if he made it up then they wouldn't have been close to anything that could have the impacts that it did yeah i i agree but you know another thing that it has in common with the invisibles as well is just the the whole idea of you know temporality you know the, the time space is not fixed that and, it, or, or it's simultaneous like i think one i was putting this stuff together in my head for the show and one of my favorite films that i know a lot of people don't like it, but I think it's really good for this reason, uh, is Cloud Atlas, because that sort of our lives are not our own from womb to tomb. We're bound to others with each crime and every act of kindness. We both our future. Cloud Atlas essentially says the same thing about time that um, The Invisibles does, which is you have essentially the opportunity, the, at each moment you have the opportunity to do good or to be free, and your decision and behavior to do that impacts time backwards and forwards and so the invisibles are part of an invisible college and i, I think grant does this really well where and he's, you know he quotes to at the beginning um there is only ever one revolution and i think you see grant processing his uh, entheogen experiences there because he's so good at time and and that's why lady edith is my favorite character like the sort of hundred year old uh, sort of quote unquote former member of of this this kind of group and understanding the difference of, of time and how it was sort of the same when she was younger and it and and king mob was there and it because it is the one thing it is the one revolution and i think he gets that um i think he gets that so right i think that's the perennial draw for me back to the invisibles is that you are always participating in that birthing of our future with every act of kindness yeah and it's very poignant too um I, this is a kind of poignant emotional content to, to her story that I, I don't think you see in some of the uh, you know where it's all just like flash bang you know oh, rev, she's rev, my rev. favorite i think she's the best yeah. like um, from a writing perspective she's the most compelling character for me and she has the most reality and and uh, it is it's a testament because he was young it's a testament that i believe every word about her understanding of age and the passing of time in in grant's mouth essentially so let's let's get into the whole sigil thing too because you know the the series itself was sort of uh imagined as sort of uh, a sigil working you know, we can get to the uh, the other sigil working, the more specific sigil working in a moment. But, you know, he was really trying to uh, construct this entire series, you know, all th or, or all three separate series and the, you know, the franchise or the, you know, the, the idea itself um, as, as a form of sigil magic. And, you know, this is something I think you could speak to a lot more eloquently than myself, because I'm not really familiar <laughs> with the mechanics of this magic. But, um, you know, that the, there was a, a very conscious and deliberate attempt to make this comic book series a sigil. And, you know, it's interesting to me, too, because, you know, we talked about how magic informs writing and, and really the, the root, you know, the basis of, of of magic and and writing are sort of have this shared lineage you know the, or the shared nativity almost and i think in the case of the invisibles you know you have something which is basically you know hieroglyphs for, for want of a better term i mean you know that there the egyptians contrary to a lot a lot of people think did have a, a form of, of actual writing you know something that we would recognize more uh, as standardized handwriting, and that the hieroglyphs were really um, 
a form of sacred writing. And it's fascinating to me that, you know, the hieroglyphs were basically pictograms. And, you know, it's a tortured analogy, but I think to construct, you know, if you're going to do a work uh, intended as, as, a, as a sigil working, that you you know you have so many shapes and lines and forms and color and and all these kind of things you know never mind all the letters you know you have so much at play uh, that you know it's it's almost like um, you know a fractal sigil or you know a quantum sigil I'm not exactly sure you know again I don't really understand the mechanics of that 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 form but yeah um, well he described it as a hyper sigil which has always been an underdeveloped idea like. <sighs> Sigils were kind of like a thing at the time, um, but it is, it's almost like you have to drop down to, well, how do you think sigils work? And then, and then, and from that level, move across to being adjacent to sigils and then move back up. And that's where you'll find something like the invisibles because you're right. Like it is, it's hieroglyphic in the sense that how do I, how does performance and depiction map to or are they identical to the thing that it is depicting or performing and that's why sigils work right um and and i you see him playing with that idea in him dressing like king mob and having the same kind of um hospitalization incidents that happen to his character like he's sort of dealing with and and living through the and it, it so it's different magical writing to providence in that sense because it's it is a performed spell that is also working on him and that says something about the creative process and, and, and reality that I don't that he tried to articulate as hyper sigil, but that idea it's because essentially at the time the thing he knew was sigils, right? Like there there, there are better words, there's better language now, I would argue, to explore the implications of somehow um somehow you can write reality and you can write yourself into it. And that is um, he, he used that as, as sigil magic, right, or, or a hyper sigil, and it's fine as a as a kind of placeholder term, but it's so much deeper than it's so much deeper than mere sigil magic. I think. Well, you know, when you talk about you know the invisibles, um, you know, and and it, again, we are looking at a very '90s work that couldn't have existed in any other decade, and wouldn't have existed in any other decade. Um, but to me. You know, if we, we're comparing uh, inv Invisibles and Providence, but, you know, the, they're in entirely separate approaches because I think, you know, all, you know for you, uh, you know, and, and people who are, who are interested in chaos magic, uh, it's, it's almost definitive, you know, chaos magic in collected form, you know? <laughs> it's almost like the, the – it, it's, it's almost – it almost defines chaos oh, magic it's, it's in a the strange canon. way. Pete Carroll and the Invisibles are the canon. Yeah, I I, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I think that's very true, and I, I think that that it was constructed, you know, very intentionally to do that. And I, I think the great thing about you know Grant Morrison being such a you know a, a character, you know, his own character, his own fictional character, and and being, you know, a very hardworking person who could do this and justice league simultaneously and you know as well as other projects is that you know if he if it wasn't grant morrison if it didn't have the kind of juice and the clout that he had in the 90s at that point in time you know this book would have just vanished probably after you know a dozen dozen or so issues of the first series run so you know it, you have a, a a series of i guess would probably be very chaotic happy accidents you know you have, see that, uh, that's why i think it shows him because you're completely correct like if it wasn't him and also if it wasn't him then because he was young um and so he had the youth to be able to to travel the world taking drugs and and writing this comic book series and and and, and to be enriched by that rather than fatigued by it in that kind of like post 40 watershed um everything about it shows him even and i think that's what i mean by the the hyper sigil thing it's like he's was you trying to find terms to articulate that this ended up being bigger than him uh and and yeah it's 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 a channel it's an only semi deliberately channeled cosmology well 
there's another there's another thing that I wanted to bring up as well. You know, in that regard, is that so? It had to be him. You know, it had to be him that did this. You know, it couldn't have been anybody else. You know, like you said, but it, you know, it had to be like ver- that publisher as well. I mean, Vertical Comics yeah, was true. shepherded by by um, you know Karen Berger, who was um, a very protective editor. Um, you know, really looked after her her writers and her artists, uh, you know, took very good, you know, close care of them and s- sheltered them from the realities of the business, you know, sheltered them from the, 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 the requirements of, you know, sales, you know, certain sales targets and all these kind of things. I mean, she was, she had a lot of clout because Sandman was a huge seller and, and Preacher, you know, was a, a huge seller and Preacher went on to be a series on AMC. And, you know, there were a few other like, you know, star earners that, that she was shepherding. So she, it was, you know, under her ages that, that this project was able to survive that, w- you know, again, would not have survived, you know, under different circumstances. You know, it always reminds me where you hear um, evolutionary scientists, you know, say, well, you, you know, there can't be life anywhere else in the universe because you've got to have just like the specific uh, mixture of elements and, you know, sunlight and all these kind of things. I mean, you know, which I don't believe at all. I mean, I'm, I'm very uh, skeptical about that entire field. But, um, you know, it's, it's almost like that kind of argument playing out in real life. It's, you know, it's almost yeah. an example of that. You know, it is, it is, um, it is almost like that that model that you know that the primordial soup, the primordial soup of of the comics industry, the direct market, the counterculture, uh, the drug culture, all these kind of things. You know that this would sort of emerge. You know this is sort of like that that classic fish that that grows legs and cr- crawls onto land. You know, like that that whole model. So I, I have I have a different one which brings us back to Providence. Uh, uh, years ago on the blog, I described the Necronomicon and the Cthulhu Mythos as uh, essentially a flying saucer crashing into our dimension and spreading the wreckage of it over about 110 years, um, so that it kind of it. That's why every uh, every individual piece kind of looks fake or or not you know, built or not of the same thing because it's actually crashing through time into our dimension. And that's kind of more in the 90s what I see happening with this, this sort of very chaos magic aesthetic. It's kind of like what you're saying, but I want to I pull it back to Providence and go like, I think it crashed in pieces and, and it looks like it could only have happened through this miraculous, happy um, circumstance of having the right editor in the right place and and all that kind of stuff, but those are the just those are the conditions that allow the portal to open, which is a very Lovecraftian thing. And when I got to the end of Providence, I'm like, holy shit, Alan thinks the same <laughs> thing I do <laughs> about what the Cthulhu mythos actually is, which is a which is that it's it's built itself. The the last component of the book for people who are unaware like the, the majority of the story is set in the early 20th century but the final bit is this almost like the end of Battlestar Galactica just kind of moving through the decades of the 20th century showing the build out of Cthulhu and the Necronomicon and, and, and all the kind of elements of the mythos that to us look individual but that's because we're looking at it in this dimension rather than it is more or less being tendrils of, uh, of the one organism in another dimension Okay, so I just want to clarify for the listeners that in this instance, we're talking about Providence because we're sort of jumping back yes. and forth between the two. Um, let me, and I just want to interject here. Um, I, I want to get on a little bit of a, a soapbox because, I mean, <laughs> this is something that I've covered on the blog and, and I, I still feel really, really strongly about. So there's this whole uh, sense that, um, that Lovecraft um, and, and the mythos, uh, the Cthulhu mythos and the Deep Ones and, and all this kind of thing just sort of popped out of his imagination one day, you know, he's just sitting around and just, uh, just put pen to paper and this all just flowed out of him. Um, Lovecraft was, was probably one of the most um, derivative and uh, near plagiaristic uh, pop culture writers <laughs> that we have in the canon and was, uh, you know, rather shameless, or not even shamelessly. He wasn't, he wasn't ashamed of it. He would tell you, he put his heart on his sleeve and tell you, you know, Poe and Dunsany and all these other people, um, and and that's 
what he was, he was almost like writing fanfic in, in some ways, you know, I mean, he was really, and, and they put this in, in the, and Alan Moore puts this in the, uh, the series, which I think is, you know, very canny and, and, and very apt where we see Lord Dunsany giving a talk that um, the, the protagonist of, of Providence attends with Lovecraft. You know, I, I think that's, um, you know, very canny on, on Moore's part. But um, one thing that I've written about on The Secret Sun, and, I, I, you know, I, I'll fight you about this <laughs> really well. It's like, uh, I really believe that um, so much of the Cthulhu mythos was um, lifted, uh, not quite verbatim, I mean, he did sort of change things around, but lifted straight out of Alice Bailey and uh, her, her whole oeuvre, which let's, you know, let's just accept the fact that she claimed the stuff was all being cha uh, channeled by one of the Ascended Masters. Um, uh, was it? Uh, he had cool in his name somewhere. So, I, I, I you know, I Quite went cool, through. cool, isn't it? Something like that, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd have to look it up. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't do well with made-up names. But um, if you look at uh, books like uh, Initiation, Human and Solar, and um, you know, just the, all her early books that were being published in New York at the same time that Lovecraft was in New York, and you know, sort of circulating among that kind of literati, uh, pulpy you know, that sort of set, you know, what we would sort of see almost as bohemians today, um, you know, that, that, that work was circulating uh, in, in those circles. And I, I just think, you know, a lot of people have criticized me for this and, you know, sort of taken me to the woodshed over this, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to budge. I think that Lovecraft was wandering around lower Manhattan one day and somebody was on the street selling her books and he picked it up and he's like, Oh, this is, this is perfect. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I think you know, if it happened, like, it, um, I think where people need to put some nuance into their reaction is buying it and reading. It doesn't mean he approved of it. Like it wasn't a secret, theosophist. I do actually believe that he was, for nightmarish reasons, the the materialist that he said he was. Oh, well, um, I do too. Yeah, so, I mean, like I, he would have read this stuff and gone, "This is trash," but I'm gonna use it. Yeah, well, listen, you know what I mean? Like, ha ha ha! This preposterous. Like, this is this is the stuff I'm looking for, and I don't think, and I, I reckon Alan gets this nails a vision of Lovecraft that I find resonant in the sense that he and and the inclusion of Lord Dunsany, who we should probably describe in a minute, is is a good example where I think. Lovecraft is almost like Grant in a way, but not um, a vector or or a node for these vectors to to become the thing that they've become. And he was sort of unwitting about that because there's a couple of bits that I thought was super interesting, which um, I'm about to ask you about because we need to play the name game because I know um, we're going to have some fun with this one. Um, so in the in the series in Providence. When um, Lovecraft and the protagonist go to visit his mother in hospital, she's there's a kind of component of like they live where for people who don't like don't know there's some glasses that one of the guys in the secret society creates and it allows you to see the extra dimensional entities floating around and Lovecraft's mother can do this in her unwell state spontaneously. Um, and the other thing that was interesting, which um, I'm going to ask you about now, is if the the secret society in it, um, the Stella Sapiente or Wisdom of the Stars, is a couple of things. It's an esoteric order, but it is also a gloss for Masonic networks in the Northeast, right? And so Lovecraft's father and grandfather were in this um, esoteric Masonic group. And that's sort of interesting for some of the other things that I know you have explored in terms of um, some of the bits that maybe don't add up in the story of Lovecraft. And it's just kind of funny that there it is in, in Providence that he's, a, he's the son and grandson of what is effectively a fictional version of esoteric Mason. Well, it was all over the place back then. I mean, people really have no concept of, of how popular it was. I mean, you know, this is pre-TV, in some cases, pre-radio, pre-motion pictures, you know, there really wasn't a lot to do, you know? <laughs> so you went to these lodges and you hung out and you drank and did these weird rituals and, you know, 
some other maybe less savory kind of activities, uh, I, I would I would venture to guess. Uh, you know, certainly if you look at the uh, the history of that, you know, particularly esoteric forms of masonry in the Old West, um, you know, they were basically how uh, criminal gangs organized themselves. Uh, they organized themselves through lodges. I mean, a, a great example of this, uh, you know, Billy the Kid, Billy the Kid, that whole story, Pat Garrett, and there was something called the, uh, the Lincoln County War in new mexico and it was basically you know the whole thing that you've heard about billy the kid and the regulators and all these kind of things it was basically two different irregular masonic lodges you know fighting for territory they, i mean they were, they were basically just gangs but they they organized themselves through these you know irregular more esoteric kind of masonic lodges so i i think that that is very you know, that feels very real. That has real texture there. You know, there's real meat on the bone, and especially setting in at New England, you know, which is very much kind of the birthplace of this. So, again, you know, Athol, you know, Athol, Massachusetts, which is still pretty isolated. And a lot of this, the cities uh, and towns that, that the character in Providence, you know, Alan Moore's comic series Providence is kind of wandering through, you know, in some cases are still very rural, you know. Yeah. But, in those days, I mean, forget it. And basically what you had, and, you know, this is something that Lovecraft, you know, people who are familiar with his work, you know, are familiar with this because, I mean, Lovecraft, travel, you know, did the same travels. You know, he sort of traveled the same circuit that the, the, the protagonist in, in Providence does. You know, he went around to all these places, you know, these, these backwoods towns in, in upstate New York and, and Vermont and western Massachusetts. You know, basically what you had is that, um, you know, particularly following the Civil War, you would have uh, veterans, you know, taking their their pension or some sort of, you know, whatever nest egg they they were able to collect, and they'd move out of the cities, you know, move out of Boston, which you know was becoming very crowded, you know, especially with a lot of uh, European uh, immigration. So they'd move out to places like like Athol, and and wait for everyone else to show up. Like they thought they were sort of settling these towns and we're going to, you know, make their fortunes when everyone else, you know, followed them there. And, and as it happened, people did not follow them there and they sort of, you know, things all sort of fell apart. And this is something, you know, this is sort of the poetry of a lot of, uh, of Lovecraft's work, you know, that, that people who sort of took off into the hinterlands, um, and became very isolated and sort of just fell apart and, and almost became, you know, uh, devolved in some ways you know this is something that the lovecraft readers are going to be very mm. familiar with and i think something that that informs uh, uh this this story but you know where, where more takes it you know is that um the these esoteric orders and collections um they're not just you know doing drinking the beer and and doing the whole Hiram of biff thing you know they're sort of involved in you know, hmm. <laughs> you know, there's the cannibals <laughs> and, yeah, the, the, and the incest. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of like unsavory things that are given sort of a magical or esoteric gloss by these groups. Absolutely, and and I know for people who might be if they, if they're out there in their masons and you know, grumble about hearing this kind of stuff, there are two ways you can pass it, right? Which is there are in fact esoteric components to or esoteric subgroups within masonry. But the other thing is historically you have, um, particularly in the U.S., although Britain as well, but much more in the U.S., a, a high degree of overlap between high degree masons and a elite power structure. So the ritual can the inclination towards ritual can be there through either sense. And what I got, and it's funny, like the just the wink at Lovecraft's potential involvement with masonry in Providence just made me realize how much Alan has just thought about the, the depth of his thinking about Lovecraft and, and the Lovecraft mythos. Was there? Uh, the, so the first thing that made me realize this was in the, I, it must be actually the first issue, where if there was, and this is a weird way of saying it after just describing the Necronomicon as a, a crashed spaceship, if there was a quote-unquote real Necronomicon in our reality, it would be the Picatrix. And in the Yellow Signs, or in the first issue of Providence, 
what Alan does is essentially blends the Necronomicon with the story of the Picatrix, not just from a name perspective, but actually it's kind of like a scarier version of how the Picatrix has ended up in the West. And it's not exactly wrong. This is why, and I'm sure he's thought the same thing because this is how I landed on it. It's not exactly wrong because the Picatrix in aggregate is how you bring stellar influences down to earth. And so if there's a real Necronomicon, it's the Picatrix, and and I, I, in, and it's coming back to the, the masonry thing. You are in such good hands with Alan Moore in Providence when it comes to what the fuck is even going on with with Lovecraft and the Mythos. Because right there, he's like, well, in some sense, it's true, and and in some sense, it's true. Yeah, there. Well, that's. That's why the the story is again. It's not fun, but it's it's very satisfying. And and you, it's it's like, you know, a good meal that isn't maybe filled with a lot of salt and sugar and preservatives. So you know, all those kind of chemicals that that get those uh, endorphins flowing. Um, you know, it's a good solid organic meal. Uh, and and it's because of things like that. You know, I mean, more. I'm sure more has could write a book on the Picatrix. I mean, he could probably write a really good book on it. He could probably write a good book on a lot of things that he does not choose to do so. I, I think that he's an extraordinarily uh, intelligent man. Uh, I, I would probably put his IQ somewhere, you know, bending the needle towards the 200 mark. Uh, he's very, very hardworking. Uh, he's got a phenomenal memory. And, um, you know... Yeah. He, and he, he can needs express to be to, himself very well. Yeah, you need to be to be that deft with, and I don't mean this disparagingly, with your artifice or your construction because it's so perfectly put together. I mean, we got to do the name game now because one, there's a character in it called Elspeth, and another character in it called Garland, and uh, and I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if either of them are familiar to you, but like, let's he plays, he's definitely playing. So, shall we say, a Crowleyan name game with this series, isn't he? Yeah, well, it, it kind of reminds me of a lot of things that um, what's that guy Jim Brandon uh, wrote uh, in like the Return of Pan with the name game and place names and 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 things like that. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a copy of Return of Pan in Alan Moore's personal li uh, library. I, I would be very shocked if there was not. But it, it seems to be, you know, for people who aren't really familiar with the series, again. Um, what Moore is doing is that he's having his main character sort of walk the stations of the Lovecraft, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. You know, he's, he's going through the greatest hits, you know, and he's meeting all the, you know, the star players of, uh, no pun intended, of, uh, of, you know, the Lovecraft mythos. And, and, um, and even a contemporary one. So the thing that interested me in, in the second issue, the hook was the, um, the, the ecclesiastical organization under the church, I think, is a reference to Peter Lavender's teenage encounters with that fake church in the Bronx that was a cover for the intelligence agencies. That, that kind of was probably the beginning of his experience in, in the intelligence community, right? But like that it just seemed that the first thing that happened is this you're essentially meeting fake uh, ecclesiastic types. And you go, that, that literally happened as part of the story of <laughs> the Lovecraft mythos. But I'll tell you something. I'm, I'm sure if if we went back and did a little digging, I'm sure that that's based on something that actually went down in that area. You know, mm, I probably. mean, not just in the Bronx, but but actually in Red Hook, Brooklyn itself. So, <laughs> you know, I I know a lot of people sort of um, group Brooklyn and the Bronx together. You know, for for social or landscape reasons but they're actually you know they're much separate parts uh you know geographically uh brooklyn is, is sort of on the tail of long island and uh the bronx is at the north of manhattan island so you know they are very different um locations so i would not be surprised you know given moore's um hyper obsessive personality uh that 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 he would be uh doing research into that but you know the one the one thing that i wanted to mention here uh, you know because getting back to my my thesis about lovecraft you're not buying into um alice bailey I'm, I'm sure that he would just pick up an alice bailey book and think you know this 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 woman is 
completely insane, uh, which I think most people do. But you know, it's the impetus that that so much of Moore's work is building off the archetypes created by other writers. You know, for instance, I mean, a great example of this is *A League of Extraordinary Gentlemen*, which takes a bunch of you know dime novel and you know boys' own story kind of heroes and collects them into a, a team. Uh, Prometheus is very clearly a, a Wonder Woman analog. Uh, Tom Strong is very clearly um, Doc Savage. Uh, you know, and you can kind of, and and for that matter, the Watchmen, um, the the origin of the, the Watchmen is that um, DC had bought the rights to uh, this defunct uh, company called Charlton, and they had a number of heroes like the Blue Beetle and so on, and Peacemaker, and uh, Moore wanted to use them for the Watchmen, and they said, no, you can't use that because we've got plans for these characters. Uh, and so he created analogs of characters that you know were really kind of cheesy ripoffs of mainstream superheroes to begin with so more is always uh you know you can say that there's a a high degree of unoriginality because he's not creating a lot of his own archetypes he's working off the archetypes of other writers but you know to me that's you know that's part of the appeal of his work yeah it's it's playing with the, the the creativity is in the playing with the archetypes and if he if he hadn't done that he wouldn't have like the overall message, it's it's kind of overdetermined, but the overall message in Watchmen wouldn't have come through if we didn't do that. And and the same thing here, which is why I'm so interested in the name game from a Crowleyan perspective. So um the names are used archetypally and, and deliberately. Like um there are to the point of almost being clunky, right? Uh, and 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 that is I mean, yeah, I mean there's one of them. So Ronald Underwood Pittman. Right as as a name, the first well, the first person to intentionally show the main character how to get into the underworld is called Underwood Pitman. Like <laughs> it, it's literally someone who goes into the underworld pit, and 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 that is there's some what that shows you is that there's a deliberate use and construction of names. Yeah, I, I think. I, I, I sort of strain to, to offer examples of that, you know, in, in earlier works of his, but I, I think that that's something that he's picked up on in the past, uh, you know, but in this case it, it is, it's like, it's, it's funny because I mean, I read, I read all of Lovecraft a long time ago and not, not even that long time ago, you know, like 20 years ago. And um, it took me a while to sort of, oh, oh, okay, that's this character, you know, because he puts them in much different contexts. You know, he's not putting them in the same context necessarily uh, as Lovecraft would put them in his stories. He's, you know, he's a, using them to tell his own narrative. But I think, you know, those name games, you know, are important to him because it's sort of that eighth dimensional chess that he's playing. Yes. Yeah, you know and I mean? and it's it's part of the semi conscious spell that's involved by by um, incorporating real people like Lord Dunsany and Lovecraft and um, kind of like clunky cipher names. So Garland Wheatley, um, we can talk about the Garland bit in a minute, but it's Dennis Wheatley to start with, and one of the other characters. So the the gay couple that essentially try to kill the protagonist. The other ones like James Montague, like Montague Summers. So there's all these names of. Um, characters from kind of like a classic British understanding of witchcraft and diabolism that are sort of structurally put in there. But the Garland thing is interesting because the sort of reverse rape character is called Elspeth, which is quite literally the Scottish version of Elizabeth. And I don't know if you have any opinion on the name Elizabeth, Chris. I'm uncertain. But um, <laughs> but it, it just seems like... Huh. rings a bell. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Something in the back of my head. <laughs> it rings a bell somewhere, yeah. Um, that character is, uh, is, is fascinating to me. It's, it's fascinating to me that he made her 13 uh, when the character that he's basing uh, that version on, um, I think it's from The Thing in the Door, right? Um, is an adult woman, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, um, a little disturbing to me. Uh, you know, there is a motif that, um, we should probably touch on that, uh, seems to occur in a lot of, uh, Alan Moore work. And that's sort of this disembodied rape, uh, motif that really started in, in Swamp Thing. Uh, there was a, uh, 
storyline, story arc in Swamp Thing that got the um, uh, Comics Code Authority to revoke uh, its approval seal, uh, which meant it couldn't be sold on newsstands uh, back in the day. Um, and it was a storyline where, um, uh, if you're familiar with Swamp Thing, but there's a female protagonist named Abigail Arcane. Um, she's married to a, a, an intelligence agent called Matt Cable. Um, her uncle is sort of the demon, demonic wizard, mad scientist character, and his name is Anton Arcane. Um, in, in the, um, the storyline, uh, her husband dies in a um, car crash, and he is uh, physically possessed by the spirit of Anton Arcane, who is... Uh, yeah, Abigail Arcane's uh, uncle. So there's a kind of uh, incestuous, uh, you know, quasi pedophilic. Uh, you know, not necessarily because they're both adult characters, but you know, there's just that kind of inference. And and this is something that we see repeated in Promethea, in a, in a storyline where a, um, a woman. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a wizard wants to, uh, you know enjoy uh, sexual congress with Promethea, but he's actually doing it through the body of, uh, of a teenage girl. And, and then again, in, um, in, in Providence, you know, with the, with the Elspeth Wade character who is uh, uh, 13. So, um, I, you know, that is something, the, the, Moore's work, uh, you know, there was a series called Lost Girls that, um, again, kind of, touches on this stuff uh you know you know you can play it either way i'm not exactly sure how people personally will think about it i find it a bit distasteful uh you know you could make the argument there that there are artistic and philosophic or even magical underpinnings to this i i, I find it you know i find those arguments a bit strained but you know, in this case, in this particular case in the story, it, it, it does speak to the nature of the character. It does speak to the nature of the, you know, the characters involved, the family that this, um, this woman uh, is from, you know, that the, she's from a, a family, you know, involved in sort of the, the nether regions of the secret society, uh, you know, the basically bad, bad guys uh, involved in ritual magic and spirit possession and so on. So, yeah. And about Again, 10 years ago, he wrote a big, he made some good points in his defense when there was some stuff uh, about um, Lost Girls in particular. I, I seem to recall him going, it's, it's the, to sort of boil it down. It's like, I write the most graphically violent stuff and no one bats an eye. And if there's sex things, everyone falls over themselves and you go, there is a point to it. I know what you mean. Like, it's, it's not my favorite part of the book. Um, and it's just, it's a thing that happens in Alan's work, I guess. Yeah, well, listen. I mean, everybody has their their shortcomings and their <laughs> their foibles. So, it, but in this particular case, it does not feel. I mean, it's very, very graphic, but it does not feel um, gratuitous, gratuitous or egregious. It, it feels that it's serving. It definitely belongs. You're right. It definitely and belongs. If you, yeah, and if you've ever read the the the, the thing on the door story, or, you know this the character Anseneth Waite, um, you know, is basically, uh, you know, a witch, but she's also, um, she's from Innsmal, so she's got that old one lineage. So, I mean, there are justifications within the story. It, it probably could have been depicted less graphically, but, you know, there are some things that you just accept are, you know, part of the, the storyteller's imperative, I guess. It's not the only kind of like, although it's it's the same adult character, but it's not the only teenage sex act. Um, in oh it. yes, and yeah. and so there's a there's a because the lead character is gay, and there is a there is a twink sex scene um, towards the end with another character called Howard Charles. Now, question for you: Is Howard Charles Robert Barlow? That's an excellent question. See, okay, so. Lovecraft is, is, is depicted as, as, as homophobic in his dealings with uh, what I call the Gordon character. Do you um, want to explain why? Because I think this is hilarious. Yeah. I, I, when I read this book, um, 
you know, just the fact that he's, you know, he's a, a writer based in, in, a, in a large met metropolitan <laughs> uh, media outlet who, who originally lived in sort of the provinces, like, I guess he's from Wisconsin in the series, and then leaves his, uh, his comfortable uh, New York media job to travel the highways and byways of, of rural uh, New England in search of um, authentic uh, folk magic. And I, I don't know about you, but I think maybe some Rune Soup uh, listeners and readers might find that. And, and what's the main character's Daily last name? familiar. Uh, Black. <laughs> right. So it's, it's Robert Black. And uh, we were, because we, this is where you began saying, you got to read this, like you're in it. And I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm still not sure I am. I, I, I joked that I was archetypal or iconic, um, but you know, he's playing, who knows? <laughs> if not, it's um, the character. Anyway, that's the main character. He's, he's, a, he's a gay journalist um, who, yeah, wanders the boondocks looking for magic and, and folklore and, there are some departures with my biography. Bangs a few, <laughs> bangs a few teenage girls. Um, but I just think, again, it comes back to you get the sense of how much Alan Moore has sat and thought about Lovecraft because, again, it sort of belongs to, in a funny way. The the Howard Charles sex scene is almost more jarring than the Elspeth one in terms of it being like mm, I didn't quite expect that. And and I'm just wondering if is it a wink at Robert Barlow? Oh, I was expecting it the minute that character showed up. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, I you know, I mean, let's not pussyfoot around this. I mean, I I, I definitely believe that that Lovecraft was was gay uh, and and had a, a sweet tooth, so to speak. I, I don't believe that. So here's the thing: in, in a real world context, outside of the world of letters, when he's writing to people that he doesn't necessarily know and people who might circulate his letters, and he's he's would kind of make you know, oh golly gosh, I don't know about this, you know, this sodomy business, <laughs> something like that. I you know, it, it, if say a character like Robert Black showed up in Lovecraft's apartment. You know, I think that Lovecraft would probably have a pretty keenly developed sense of gaydar and would not make those kind of comments. And, you know, there would probably be some, you know. This is what I think the long... Um, going on there. That's I, what I, I think I, the Lower Manhattan late night walks were about. I think he was cruising. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Um, and, you know, his marriage just seems like, you know, sort of classic co-bearding. In my estimation, at least, I, I, you know, uh, you know, a Jewish woman who runs a hat shop, you know, and they didn't spend a lot of time together. It, it just, it, it smacks pretty strongly of bearding, and the fact that he ended up in in Red Hook, um, uh, a place that he hated and was away from his beloved Providence. I, I think he's, again, a Lovecraft fans I know can get really fanatic about this this thing, but. I, I get the sense that there might have been like maybe some what they call quote unquote moral offenses. In I his... think he was run out of town. I think. I, I think. Yeah. He, he may be. Like, I, I don't think that. It was more like it wouldn't surprise me if the reason that he ended up in exile was because he maybe made a pass at the wrong high school boy. Yeah. Just the fact, you know, the fact that he would engage in, you know, this relationship with Barlow, that doesn't seem like, you don't just sort of like fall into that. It's like, you know, he wakes up one morning and he's like, you know, I'm kind of sick of my wife. I think I'm going to like really get into this whole teenage boy business down in Florida. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It just, it doesn't make any sense to me. It, it's not rational. You know, um, you know, you had the reality of, of the closet back then. I mean, uh, you, know, you could be arrested, you know, if, certain activities or even just on suspicion of such. So I, I think that um, that I think is, is maybe where more drops the ball a little bit. Maybe he's playing too much to the, the public archetype of Lovecraft and not necessarily. Um, but know, he's yeah. obviously thought oh. about it. Like, cause I, I think, cause the other thing about Barlow is, but this is again, we're talking about problematic stuff. Thanks a lot, Alan. And I don't want people to misread what we're talking about as in, you know, the minor asked for it sense. But um, in the case of Barlow, Barlow initiated 
the um, letter correspondence, right? Because he was ostensibly a fan, and they did hang out together. And so, it, it, again, different time, different legality. Please don't anyone listening think I'm saying like the teenage boy was asking for the adult man to to become his lover. Um, probably was though, and and that's what I. That's why I think Howard Charles. That's why I think Howard Charles is Alan Moore's Robert Barlow because if you, if you read the book, that is a um, surprising yet very consensual sex act. Well, the other thing too, um, in in that regard, is that it almost seems to me that that Robert Black is is not only you know Gordon White, but he's also um, you know in that sort of dream logic type of storytelling that he's also a mirror image of Lovecraft himself. You know, he's Lovecraft kind of meeting an aspect of himself, a projection of himself, that Black is, in in part, is like a love, I don't want to necessarily say like a an alter ego, maybe even like a tulpa or something. He's yeah, almost like a tulpa that. of Lovecraft going in search of Lovecraft, you know, going in search of his authentic self. And, you know, I don't know if Alan Moore thought of it in these terms but, but it comes across as that because if if lovecraft had been less fucked up um he could have been a journalist at a at a, at a major metro like if, if he wasn't so goddamn broken and weird um he and probably would have been just like a closet gay manhattan newspaper journalist yeah yeah i i and maybe he had a desire to do so when he moved to uh, New York in the first place. I mean, you know, he did sort of get involved with uh, Houdini, you know, and maybe he saw that. So he did a, he ghost wrote a book for the Houdini, right? The, um, I f- was, yeah. I remember, yeah. Some about the plague of superstition. Or something, something yeah. like that. Speaking, but of, I, I, speaking of intelligence connections anyway. Yeah. Well, see, that's the other thing too. So um, again, this is something that I, I was very treated very gingerly when I, when I broached the subject on my blog, but um, I, I, I have a very strong feeling that um, Lovecraft wasn't just traveling around to um, random cities uh, in the middle of America on a lark, you know, particularly since he said he never had any money. I, you know, my strong sense, and you and I have discussed this in the past, is that he was working as a courier. And he was probably working as a courier for, um, you know, some Masonic sort of intelligence. Networks. Yeah, Masonic networks or intelligence networks inside. It's, they're they're identical. They're identical now, um, but they're identical then. I don't mean that the CIA is Masonic. I mean that definitionally, Masonic networks are an intelligence network. But we are talking pre-creation of the national security state, as we understand. But we're certainly not talking pre-intelligence, right? And and I that's. It's funny because it's if um, if Alan Moore had has read any Rune Soup, he's also read some Secret Sun because um, there aren't too many other people that have kind of looked at it and gone, "Look, let me table this hypothesis." Um, his family being it's his absent father and, and the grandfather and so on being sort of solid Northeast middle class, probably Masons, and then here's my explanation for how he managed to afford and why he went on these travels given that he was such a misanthrope like it's not like he liked the world it's not like oh let me <laughs> let me see the big wide world he didn't care for it well i also feel like i also get the sense that he might have been sort of strong-armed into it so you know again we're looking at the days of the closet and you know uh if you were found out to be gay in those days you know particularly by the cops or people in intelligence agencies and so on and so forth um you know a lot of times you'd end up on the hook with them you know what i'm saying and this is pretty well known i mean uh as informants uh you know for honey traps i mean all sorts of uh, things that would go on like that so you know this is supposition i mean i i do want to just say exactly. that this is supposition like, but it, you know it's just sort of filling in the blanks because a lot of lovecraft story as it's told by official biographers doesn't make any sense. No, there, there are doesn't. bits that you can't, you, you can actually just look up how much a train ticket costs from like Penn Station to Nowhereville, Florida, and go, well, he was eating half a can of beans a day. What, like, how is, how is that happening? Do you know what I mean? And, and so you're right. Like, it's, it is an effectively evidence-free 
hypothesis and it will be permanently evidence-free, but it's not a bad one. Like that's, that's what it is. And, and people, I think, and it's, it's a misunderstanding of how the world worked at the time. When you say he was a courier, that's literally a courier. Like it doesn't mean he was off doing some sort of James Bond daring do. There are some things if you are, if, if you are masonically affiliated businesses, there are some things that you probably shouldn't, like private correspondence, that you shouldn't put through the mail. Because if you're in competition with other people, you don't do that because they, they have operants working at the, like, you know, the post office as well. This has always been the game. This has been the game since the medieval guilds. That's actually how uh, medieval guilds would have couriers for the same reason, which is this, this message must get to someone else unmolested. It's not he's off down there doing, like, you know, killing Nazis or whatever. It's, um, it, it is as banal and probably as resentful. Um, an activity as you need to take this letter or this bag, which you cannot open to this person in wherever. Well, you know, it would be a bike messenger today. I mean, it's just, yes. it's, it's grunt work, you know? And, and again, like when you start, <sighs> Hollywood just sort of distorts everything and, and gives people a, 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 you know, a distorted image of the things that you're trying to convey, but it's, it's actually just, like you said, it's entirely banal. It's entirely ordinary. It's entirely mundane. <clears throat> and if you look at his history, there's absolutely no reason for him to be going to, I don't know, Little Rock or something. I mean, I, you know, wherever he would end up, Charleston, uh, Rochester, you know, places that aren't really tourist traps. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, there's not a lot to do there. You know, and if you're taking a bus or a train, I mean, it, it was certainly a lot cheaper back then, but, you know, it, like you said, if I mean, he's, you know, living on a chunk of cheese and a can of beans for a week, you just, you can't, you can't do that. It's just absurd. I think this is a lot of mythology. I, I, he might've even, you know, it might be the fact that he, he had family money that he didn't want to mention. Maybe he was crying poverty to sort of romanticize himself, make himself look like a hero, you know, a martyr. I mean, who knows, but if you just look and, you know, I don't want to put down the biographers because a lot of them no, sure. like excellent, excellent work. It's you know, I mean, jo Josie, uh, S.T. Josie uh, appears in, in the flesh in, in this series uh, as a, yeah, as a that's character. True. Yeah. And, you know, he's done phenomenal work. I mean, you know, his work has, has been excellent. But, you know, I, I just wonder that because they're also fans that they might not want to ask questions that might be seen, you know, as casting you know, but also, craft in any and, more of a negative and, light than he has been already. You know, and, and I say it with love. It takes a Nolsian mind to see patterns like that. And 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 if you're trying to do a uh, an already challenging job, which is to perform a biography on someone you like who is also kind of an asshole, um, you kind of got your hands full. <laughs> but I think that's I think Alan, whether or not he's at least thought through these ideas himself, because he he gives Lovecraft. Uh, essentially an esoteric Masonic lineage in the context of, of Providence. So it's one of the things that, as I'm reading through it, going, holy shit, like Alan, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised, because as you say, probably 200 IQ, brilliant, blah, blah, blah. But also like he has spent a lot of time sitting quietly in Northampton stoned thinking about Lovecraft. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it, it really is. I mean, it is fan fiction. You know what I mean? And it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a quasi hagiography hey, hey that he wanted to, you know, when we talk about this dream logic, where you have this sort of tulpa of Lovecraft, you know, he, he understands that Lovecraft is this very imperfect and, and problematic character. So he sort of creates a purer version of him, you know, in search of his authentic self to sort of, you know, so you can focus on the Lovecraft mythos. You can focus on the Lovecraft story without necessarily focusing on Lovecraft himself you can sort of focus on this idealized projection of lovecraft um that you know is far less problematic is much more sympathetic you know is much more pleasant you know much more of a like a kind of decent salt of the earth character and and that to me is what somebody with more storytelling chops does when you want to write you know this glowing semi hagiographic uh, fanfic about this guy. The other thing, and this is where you, the, the strong arm twisted the, the greatest when you said you need to read Providence, was you said this is actually Alan Moore's, this is what Alan Moore actually thinks about magic. 
it's 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 not in Promethea, it's here. And and it is the which I've always hoped was there, but you do have the I guess the political problem of you don't wanna you don't wanna scare the nerds, where there's that sort of classic Alan Moore cosmology of the one place, you know, the gods are can be said to inarguably exist is in the human imagination where they are something great and terrible, blah, 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 right? And that just sounds like um, almost almost Dawkins-level jibber-jabber. Um, but I knew it wasn't that. Like, he has a, a decent understanding of the imaginal, um, and, and I would actually say a hyper-competent understanding of the imaginal after reading Providence, because I believe that's what you were getting at, that here is you actually have Alan laying out for us, this is what I fucking mean about the imaginal and the spirit world, you idiots. Uh, and it's, and I, I read through it going, I don't, like, where is the lie? I, th- I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think he absolutely nails the imaginal and the spirit world in this. What do you think? I mean, talk us through how he describes it and, and your opinion of it. Well, that's, that's a big job because... Sure. Um, a lot of what he presents as magic, um, he, he does the very clever move of offering you a rational counter-argument. So in other words, you, he'll depict a magical event. And one of, one of the events I'm thinking of, you know, sort of the classic example of that is when he, he goes, you know, they tell him, don't go down in the basement. And he goes down in the basement and then, you know, just sort of discovers this upper rung of hell that he sort of wanders through and he's chased by a demon and so on and so forth. And then, you know, he wakes up on the floor because there's a gas leak and and everything like that. And you kind of get the sense that um, maybe the, you know, the gas leak is real, but that's not, you know, you know, the Dawkins mentality can go, Oh, well, you know, he just was hallucinating because he had inhaled this, this gas that was leaking from this furnace. But, you know, if you have a magical mindset, you're going to look at it and say, well, that's half of the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because what he, he, you know, the gas and whatever effect it had on it, what it actually did was open this portal exactly. to this other reality that, you know, is as real and as internally consistent as the reality that we live in ourselves. Um, but you can't access it through conventional means. You know, you can't access it through uh, normal, you know, ordinary consciousness. I, I know that you know Jeff Kripal has talked a lot about this. That- you, you have to be crazy, and because it is a Lovecraft story, the main character gets progressively more insane as it goes on, and, and ultimately goes ball fucking nuts, crazy. And you know how Lovecraft stories end. I'm not ruining anything, but to, to say that. He dies, right? But it's each contact event. So that's the first one. That's in in Red Hook, um, where he wanders down a basement and yeah, encounters like an upper realm of hell. And then the guy who runs the place is like, "Oh, sorry, you had a gas leak." And then the next time is um, with the photographer in in Boston. Well, the next conscious- well, the next time is is when he's up in New Hampshire. And he's experiencing all the time slips. Sure, sure, sure. The car yeah. going by, and you know, I, you well, know, I, I want to talk about. I want to come back to the time thing because I think that's where Grant has him beat. But it, it, like, in terms of the sort of entrances into the underworld, then it's with the photographer who says, "Well, I'll show you," and he takes him down to the basement, which is a sort of metaphor for I mean, it is a basement, but the use of steps to kind of get into your unconscious. And then it's like, "Wow, your your uh, your use of hypnosis is so good, I could almost feel that thing next to me." And then. Um, and then he, when he meets the, oh, who do you think that character is, by the way? Who do you think, um, is it Randall Carver? The, the sort of writer, friend? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Randolph Carter. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Randolph Carter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then he gets taught how to do it. But it's, it's funny, like, you get the progressive, you have a sort of Lovecraft inflection or flavor to Alan Moore's depiction of the imaginal, which is like, you need... Drugs can accidentally get you there, but like repeated contact will send you crazy, but also you need to be crazy to get there. And it, it's, it's, it's that kind of like that aspect of the dreamlands, which is what he calls it. Um, that sort of Lovecraftian corner of the dreamlands will send you insane, but you also have to be crazy to get there. And I, I, it, it's just, it's so deft in, in that really Morian sense of um, 
how he nests the contact experiences with the progressive descent into insanity of the main character, whilst I think simultaneously giving you, particularly towards the end and, and, and the kind of climax, where he's essentially describing the collective unconscious as identical to the spirit world. Uh, and, and it's almost like the, the guys who are working for the, um, the old ones are almost like a dodgy version of, of the Jungian notion of making the unconscious conscious. And, and in particular, these aspects that are associated with Lovecraftian beings and the stars. And I just, I don't know, I don't know where the lie is. I, I just think he, he nailed it. Well, I want to, I want to expand on that because so Moore's, you know, clearly building on Lovecraft, but I, I guess when I was, I don't know if we were talking about this, but I was doing some reading into Lovecraft and I was doing some reading into the basis of the stories. And, and more often than you would expect, a lot of these stories are based on things that, you know, were in the news, the things that happened, uh, you know, in what is most commonly called Lovecraft country. And, and Lovecraft country is this sort of crescent that, um, exists in the in the northeast uh you know the northeastern corner of new, of new england and i i just want to sort of go into this because you know you know that i've got a lot of personal experience in that area you know particularly that innsmouth area that um you know became so well known in in the novels and so on so um I think so. The the, the 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 cornerstone of this for for Lovecraft is that I think a lot of his curiosity about these areas, like I said, had to do with news stories that he would read, but also his travels. You know, when these these areas, I mean, if you go to Gloucester now, Gloucester, Massachusetts, it's like yuppie hell, and and like houses are all like parked up. You know, but to not, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they're right on top of each other. Um, but back in Lovecraft's time, this was, you know, a, a dangerous backwater, you know, it really was. And, you know, that whole area of Cape Ann, where you have, uh, you know, Rockport and, and Gloucester and Raleigh and going down towards Beverly and, and Salem, you know, just that whole corner of, uh, of Northeastern New England. So I think what the, the, the milieu that, he, that Lovecraft was exploring and i think that more is expanding on is um it's a it's a blend of um scott's irish folk magic um because some of these areas are a lot more hillbilly than you think they are i mean you know uh, the, the western end of uh new england is on the appalachian trail you know what i'm saying so this, this there is that influence and you know when even when i was young if you went to certain parts of new hampshire or vermont or massachusetts it was it was as redneck as you get, you know, I mean, people were driving around with Confederate flags on their, uh, their trucks and listening to country music and the, you know, the whole nine yards, it was, you know, and there's still parts of Pennsylvania, they call Pennsylvania, you know, that the heartland of Pennsylvania is, you know, when you get outside of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and so on, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty backwoods. So it's the Scots Irish folk magic, um, combining, you know, again, we, we talked about irregular Freemasonry, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, maybe even like some strains of OTO. Uh, you know, Crowley, I mean, Crowley was up in New Hampshire, right? <laughs> you know, some, some reason Crowley himself, Alistair Crowley himself ended up in Lovecraft country. You, know, you see what I'm saying? So it's just like, uh, I, I think there's some sort of pull, there's some sort of center of gravity in that area that is unique and may have mainly dissipated now because of gentrification and so on. But I, I think there are still vestiges of it, but it's this mix of, um, so again, it's a Scots magic, uh, maybe in some forms of, um, I don't know, Cornish or Welsh, you know, just these sort of, the, you know, Celtic fringe, uh, brands of folk magic combining with, uh, you know, with, more English, more urban Freemasonry, secret societies, and so on. We so, sort of see like these backwoods people in Masonic regalia in the series, but also indigenous uh, traditions. Because, uh, you know, as soon as the, the Puritans got to Massachusetts, they just started setting up Indian schools, what they called Indian schools, where, you know, basically they were um, raising 
Indian children and orphans, you know, to be Christian, English speaking, so on and so forth. And you know, there's just a tremendous amount of intermarriage. This is something that people don't really understand about New England is that, you know, even from the very early day days that settlers were intermarrying with, with Indians, uh, you know, Native Americans, uh, pretty early on. And this was not uncommon. So it's, and then we sort of see it, you know, with, um, with Salem, right? Because Salem really starts, you know, the whole witch craze starts with the stories that, I, was she Jamaican or Trinidadian? There's, there's uh, some slave in, in one of these households was from the uh, Caribbean. Tr Trinidadian. I, I, I know who you mean. Um, Tatuba. Yeah. So, you know, so we had, so we had this like very, uh, I think, extraordinarily potent and, and unique uh, blend of, you know, for lack of a better term, magic in this corner, you know, particularly in the sort of the fringes and the outskirts of the corner, because, you know, I got to tell you, I mean, like the first real honest to God UFO sighting I had was in 2015, you know, not that long ago. And it was as we were entering New Hampshire, because that area, you know, around Salem, around American Stonehenge, um, it's pretty notorious, and, and and we're talking like orbs, and I saw them, and you know, saw them for a good chunk of time, like almost a minute, and I'm like, those, you know, that's not drones, that's something like kind of sickly and disturbing, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of that around there, and um, there always has been. I mean, a lot of the, you know, the, the most well known. Uh, UFO abduction cases. I mean, you've got the hills from Portsmouth. You know, that's that. You know, right smack dab in the center of of Lovecraft Country. Um, you have Betty Andreasen. You're getting towards the southern uh, end of the Crescent, a little out west. You know, you had a, a very famous uh, you know abduction case. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on, and um, you know, I'm not saying it's you know, physical aliens and metal spaceships, but, you know, it's some sort of spirit contact that, that I think is a lot older than, than people give it credit for. And, uh, you know, like I said, I mean, I saw those UFOs myself and, and, you know, readers of the blog will know that I had a, you know, a leprechaun encounter when I was uh, young and very sick. So it, it's, it's baked into the stone. It really is. And I, I think that Lovecraft wasn't just pulling these things out of the air i think that he was just basing it on his observations but also basing it on news stories because i think there's a lot of the stuff going on um you know this is before television a lot of times it's before electricity uh you know i, th I think interaction with the spirit world was a m lot a lot more common mm. uh back in those days i really do i mean i, I feel that very strongly and and it it the manifestations sort of arose in this milieu, like I said, of this blend of, you know, this different traditions that uh, sort of created something new entirely, you know. It's a uh, place is one of the areas, because we should probably um, go back to, to a, a weird kind of comparison to, because I want to build these, these topic areas up to make a definitive statement um, towards the end but like place is treated much better in providence um which oh, yeah. is surprising because it's my understanding that alan moore hasn't been to lovecraft country is that correct uh i i don't even know the last time he's left like That's you know the circuit I mean. between northampton and london um he's a, he's very famous as a hermit um i i gotta tell you though i mean i'm from that area and uh, you know i'm sort of old enough to remember when there was still sort of vestiges of of that old rural i mean not as old as you know as in lovecraft but you know uh, oh I no no i mean like um it's you can tell it's, it comes back to this image i have of alan in in uh, northampton just thinking so much about this and quite literally pouring over maps because maps of these different towns are, are a, a visual motif in the series, right? Um, yeah, but so no, he, what I'm saying is that I, I, it feels like very well realized to me. You know, oh, like, that's, what, that's what I'm getting to. Like he's, he's thought a lot about it. And the, the point I'm building to is like, where does he think Arkham, where, what does he think is the quote unquote real Arkham? If we're, we're like, cause this is someone who's like thought about Lovecraft country, all the different towns of his life and, and the different areas and, and things that have happened in different stories. And, and the maps are there in the, in the graphic novel series. Um, and, and so the idea of place and, and 
and the interactivity and connections between them is is um, really really potent and and well delivered in in Providence. But uh, Arkham famously isn't real. Like, well, it's it's a fictional town, but where is it actually, <laughs> according to Eleanor well, and you? <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting because I, um, I actually used to uh, know when I was young uh, a Lovecraft scholar named Will Murray, and Will Murray um, is has the the benefit of being from, you know, he's from Quincy, so he's very familiar with the region that 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 Lovecraft was was referencing in his stories. Um, I believe that Will Murray thought that um, Arkham was Salem. That Innsmouth was Gloucester. Uh, I'm just trying to think. You know, it's 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 confusing though because he sort of you know he'll mention Arkham and then he'll mention Salem, but yeah. you know he you know the geography that he alludes to um, will be describing Salem, will be describing uh, Gloucester. Oh, uh, you know, one of the stories that I wanted to bring up because I mean this is something I sort of have uh, an unhappy connection to is. Um, so, you know, the whole, the spirit world in, in, you know, particularly in colonial times and in and, and rural areas, um, you know, the kind of stories that, that Moore is, is channeling and, and I think that inspired uh, Lovecraft to begin with, there was a, a very famous case called the, you know, the ghost Indian invasion. And what it was is that in, in Gloucester, Massachusetts, um, somewhere between uh, what's, what's now called Dogtown and, and what was then called Babson's Farm, uh, there were all these uh, salt marshes. And uh, a farmer in, in the late 1600s had uh, been sort of aroused because there was an invasion of, um, you know, what were called ghost Indians, which were uh, uh, like na- apparitions or specters of... Um, of uh, Native Americans and, and I believe some French soldiers, and, or maybe Native Americans in French military dress. But this was such a big deal. I mean, it roused the entire town, and a lot of people were witness to this. That it um, even, you know, Cotton Mather uh, got involved in it, and you know, Cotton Mather was down in Boston and sort of running the, the show for the uh, the corporate uh, Jonestown that was uh, Eastern Massachusetts at the time. Um, you know that this was a you know a very very big deal at the time, and there was an investigation of it, and you know church figures got involved in it, and I you know this to me has the kind of um, you know the folklore uh, that that I think really in, informs uh, Lovecraft. But you know I, we've spoken in the past that you know uh, ghosts and and all these sort of uh, manifestations, you know, were still very much part of the culture when I was growing up. I mean, probably a lot less so now, but, you know, uh, trading ghost stories was, was a favorite pastime for, for pretty much everyone at that point in time. So, the, you know, the, the, the reality of the spirit world was something that was very um, present in the mind, you know, certainly uh, in Lovecraft's time. So what I'm trying to say, you know, to boil this all down, is I don't think more is just like picking up on like sort of the imaginings of this weird, you know, probably closeted, uh, racist, anti-Semite. Racist, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, in 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 a sort of decaying mansion in, you know, a downscale Providence neighborhood. You know, I, what what feeds into this, and what I think feeds into it so powerfully, is you know, like sort of the real experience and the real observations and the real events. You know that are passed down to us, you know, as folklore, but you know, have, have basis in real experience, and and that's, to me, is the um, the resonance of that. You know, I mean, even with the old ones. So okay, so the old ones, you know, I strongly believe, uh, are taken in large part from uh, Blavatsky, but also Blavatsky by way of of Alice Bailey. You know, but uh, they weren't just making the stuff up at a whole cloth. I mean, this is based on, you know, really potent ancient religions that people, you know, people by the hundreds of thousands would kill and die for. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is how... Sure. And, and even know, the notion of the difference between elder gods, like the successions of gods is, is a Laurasian motif. So it's like 
45,000, 25 to 50,000 years old, according to Dr. Witzel. But you have like a, a simple example of the difference between the gods of Olympus and the Titans, right? So there, we've always had the notion in the back of our nightmares that there are, there are the gods and there are other things. Well, the whole idea of the abyss too, I mean, the abyss is always sort of seen as like, you know, the pits of hell, but the abyss is the depths of the ocean. Um, you know, I mean, the, the word itself uh, comes, what is it, Apsu, or the uh, Sumerian god of the deep or goddess of the deep. So, I mean, these traditions, you know, these are, these are baked into our culture, you know. I mean, these stories have been passed down for, you know, like you said, like the Laurasian period, tens of thousands of years. I mean, they've gone through all these different iterations. I mean, they, th these traditions animated people's lives. They certainly animated our culture. And, and not just Western culture, but culture around the world. I mean, you know, mermaids and, uh, you know, human personages in, in the ocean. I mean, these, these myths are universal. So, uh, possibly for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, possibly for a reason. You know, like I keep trying to remind people, I mean, you know, they, they take it for granted, but, you know, the siren is one of the most ubiquitous symbols uh, in the world today, you know, probably more so than the, the cross even at this point in time. I mean, you can't go into any store in America, you know, any grocery store or convenience store or supermarket without seeing that symbol, you know, certainly all over the beverage aisle. And, and you know, there, there are Starbucks in, in every street corner of, of every major city in, in the Western Hemisphere. So uh, people just, they don't look at it you know, they just, they don't understand it. They take it for granted. It's, it's, it's hiding in plain sight. They don't understand this is extraordinarily potent. I mean, there is the old one right there. You know, when you talk sure. about the old ones returning, yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. I think that's what, um, what I find, and it's why I want people to, to read it as well, uh, from a magical perspective, it feels like Alan Moore put his personal magic cosmology in like, here's what I think about magic described almost like through Lovecraft, right? Uh, um, and, and by doing that, he gets the reality of the spirit world in a way that I, I'm essentially in 95% agreement with how he depicts the spirit world and its impact on the waking world in Providence. Um, and as you say, like, if you do that and if you spend enough time thinking on it and, and are aware that there is a, um, an actual reality to the imaginal, then even if you haven't visited Lovecraft country, just bring it back to place, you get place right. You, you, you can deliver the sense of it because you've actually found its taste. But I mean, the thing about Salem versus Arkham, right, is as you say, they mentioned differently, but you also need the university. You also need Miskatonic. <laughs> and, and I mean, where do you think he lands Arkham in, in Providence? Where do you, like Alan in particular? We don't know if, if Lovecraft based it on one individual town or if it is, as you kind of mentioned, and it probably is this, let's be honest, like a composite of eerie things about Lovecraft country, which he wouldn't have called, he should have called it that, but um, he didn't. I mean, it is realistically a composite, but it is it majority one town more than another in the area, you think? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a composite, but I, I think the whole Miskatonic thing, um, it's, it's sort of pigeon, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what, what tribe, you know, a lot of, the, you know, Massasoit, let's just say, you know, the Massasoits. Um, but I, I think that, more, you know, more, okay, so Arkham was probably Salem. Um, you know, Salem is a small city. Uh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, there is a, a, a fairly well-known college in Salem whose name escapes me at the moment. But um, I, I think that that, that, so that was the reality to, to Lovecraft. More it's more the idea of Arkham, you know, that Arkham is, it's imaginal, but it, it's, it's been so ingrained in the culture by now, you know, and through inference with Arkham Asylum and the whole Batman mythos, that it, it has its own reality. Uh, you know, Arkham, yes. the fictional city is probably, you know, more real to, to most people than, you know, most cities in massachusetts itself i mean you know e you know even like a fairly large city like you know springfield or, or worcester you know, even boston itself i mean you know arkham 
it's, it's an archetype. It, it's, it's been burnt into the culture. You know, it's been carved into the stone of our, you know, of our collective imagination. So I think, and I want to take it back to almost like the, the siren thing, because I prefer the sort of Jungian idea of these things coming up from the deep. And I do think that's what the abyss and the ocean, that's why it's, it's both true and insufficiently true that when, you know, earlier cultures were, you can map the idea of the stars and the ocean as, as the same thing, right? Like cosmic sea and so on. Yes, fine. But by the same token, it's also this imaginal idea. And, and, and I think Arkham is a thing that has emerged from the gloom itself. It's, it's a city that these entities need. And it's a, a good one as an example of how it, it's kind of crashed over 120 years like a spaceship as well. Because I think of playing Arkham Horror um, when it came out as, as a sort of, you know, um, that would have been early college or something. Uh, and, and how Arkham grew in reputation over the 20th century as the other uh, sort of post Lovecraft authors in his orbit started using that idea and then the mythos mm-hmm. informing games and so on. So you're right. Like Arkham is kind of like more real than most Massachusetts towns because it's, it's lifted itself up from the gloom into, into the sort of like close to waking dream state. Well, when you t- it's it's funny too because when you talk about like name magic, like there's something very potent just about those letters and those sounds, you know, it, they're you know that hard arc, you know. But arc also is like Noah's Ark and you know the destruction, the the, the inundation, you you know uh, the, the whole thing with uh, the Watchers, um, you know, this all this uh, biblical and, and extra biblical mythology that that you know noah's ark you know and there was the the recent uh aronofsky film you know where the watches are these giant rock giants this uh, uh you know uh angels so i i think that the whole you know even the word see yeah it's it's a lot it's you know, mis- it's, miskatonic it's, i mean you know miskatonic could be anywhere in new england i mean it could just be like you know it could just be like any posted stamp town in the middle of uh you know the mass pike but the way these words are chosen you know when you rec- when you see these words for the first time and i know i had this experience when i did when i was young there's just some po- there's some inherent power in these names that he he created um and don't or ask found. Me why. like that's like i but Ar- i agree like arkham has an arc component to it also arcane and it just feels because it is it's a summoning because it you kind of build up to that K crescendo and you have the the soft come down of their H A M like and ham is is um, Anglo Saxon for farm so it's it's almost a kind of creepy Sumerian idea of a um, a human farm <laughs> but yeah it, like, yeah it, it, it um, really is yeah I know what you mean like the word and miskatonic has has tonic at the end of it and it's almost like a false potion and and, and there's something about the words that has a has a hyper reality, like it, you couldn't find it on a map because maps can't contain it. It's that really Lovecraftian idea. It's a it's a different category of real. See, I think my, my personal take on, on on Lovecraft, you know, even though he fancied himself a um, a rationalist and you know a Darwinian and so on and so forth, um, I think that he spent most of his life in in, in a very powerful liminal state. Um, I would not, you know, we know about the night gaunts and things like that. I would not be surprised if he, you know, he had problems with his like sleep paralysis. Um, this kid had dreaming. nightmares and night terrors, no question. And and if you look at his relationship to the dark, it it involves, as we presume, cruising and and the danger involved in that. And like he was in a permanent state of exorcism and and paranoia. He had to have been, if like I, I and. I think he w- he held the candle of his rationalism and atheism as this tiny little light in the wind against the darkness, and I don't think, <laughs> I don't think he believed it with the same level of confidence that um, you can kind of see in his writing. Well, it's almost like you know, like um, you know, a vamp- somebody being attacked by a vampire, holding up a cross, and then discovering that you know the, the vampire actually isn't you know inhibited by the cross in any way. I think that it was. Um, I think a lot of what he uh, took on was a pose. I, I think that he was um, a deeply, I, I, he suffered from deep anxieties. I mean, just, you know, how he died and what he died of, 
you know, anxiety and depression and all those sort of ailments always manifest themselves in the gut, right? You know, that's, that's pretty well known that um, a lot of these kind of uh, negative yeah, stressors will impact, you know, the, the, the digestive system. So, I, you know, I think, you know, when you see like when people say, oh, he's racist and he's this and that, and he's like, I, you know, all right, that's true. A lot of people were back then. It was, it was pretty common. It was pretty common when I was young. It's pretty common in a lot of places now. Uh, I, I think what with Lovecraft's, um, you know, I think he basically was living his life in a state of heightened anxiety and, um, you know, hyper alertness, hyper vigilance. I, I, I think that he was deeply afraid um, of everything. And it manifested himself uh, in these races and so on. You know, is he was deeply phobic. You know, he's deeply deeply phobic of the other because everything seemed to be threatening to him. But I think a lot of it has to do with like the fact that he was raised by two lunatics, and you know, his yeah. father died of of syphilis, dementia, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, uh, it was a different world back then, and. Um, you didn't have like sort of the support systems. You didn't have pop psychology and all these kind of things to draw on, you know, to lean on. So, yeah, I mean, he was uh, an unpleasant man, but I think he was an unpleasant man because his life experience was deeply unpleasant. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, it, it does. It wouldn't surprise me. Like, cause usually when, if people, it's almost like a, a binary that needs to be get past to where we need to get past, which is that if you dare make the statement that he's anything other than, or he was anything other than an atheist rationalist, people jump down your throat expecting that you're going to say, oh, he actually literally, literally believed in, in the elder gods and the old ones and so on. Like he was secretly practicing this thing that he was writing about. No, that's crap. That didn't, that's, a, that's a false binary, right? Yeah, exactly, um, yeah. Uh, and and that's not it. And it might be worth for people listening to think of it more in a, he was a fire in the sky kind of person. He would have had some kind of contact event or ongoing ones in like a sleep paralysis, hag attack, whatever, like stuff that we maybe would categorize. We have no evidence for this other than the fact that he was clearly processing nightmares as, <laughs> as, a, as a human with his creativity. That's enough. Yeah. That's enough. To go like, okay, well, in our wider understanding of what a, what a classic alien abduction or contact event looks and feels like maybe consider him more like a fire in the sky type that he's had this thing that he's now that, that has had flow and effects through, through the rest of his life. And it's not the one thing that happened to him, but as you say, he was, he's persistently phobic um, and, and essentially died of anxiety and phobia. So there was something was hunting him his whole life, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting to me because so a number of years ago on the blog, I wrote about um, this, uh, there was this group, uh, actually still around, this group called Stereolab, but like a lot of the early music, um, there are certain groups and songs that sort of hit me. It's like, okay, I've heard the song a million years ago. I, I've known the song all my life, but I've known it in like another reality. It, it, and when I listen to the song, I can sort of in, inhabit that reality. It's, it's, very difficult to explain, but you know why would certain people describe things as you know dreamlike or uh, you know I feel like I'm in a dream? Well, you know, do we do we have the same dreams? You know, how is it triggering this dream reaction when you know none of the sort of particulars or the external um, markers of a dream would be present? But I think that you know there's a shared you know, for lack of a better term, because I really hate this term, collective unconsciousness, that we sort of travel in different corners of and we travel in and out of different corners of. But I think the reason why Lovecraft still resonates, you know, despite, you know, his terrible writing and despite his, you know, his terrible biography and so on and so forth, is because he hit, the sweet spot that everybody seems to respond, not everybody, but certain people seem to respond to very powerfully as like, Oh, okay. 
I inhabited that world. Maybe not those particulars, maybe yeah. not the particular things that are going on, but what he's describing, even though he's using all this archaic language and all this purple prose, okay, I've been there. I, kn I know what that world is like. I, I didn't see that particular character or that particular monster there, but... It's the same rough feel. Yeah, yeah, I reckon that landscape. So... Are we going to give spoilers here? Are we going to, are we going to yeah, go yeah, for spoil the spoiler way? Spoiler way, because we should actually go for it. Keep going. Okay. So, what so the story takes place predominantly in the, you know, the early 20th century. And then, as Gordon alluded to, you have the sort of montage of, of how Lovecraft mythos is, is absorbed into the culture, you know, mourning of the magicians and the hippies and so on and so forth. And then you kind of end up in, you know, the final issue um, being sort of thrown into this, um, you know, this apocalyptic nightmare. And it's an apocalyptic nightmare where the, the barriers, you know, the sort of the membranes between dream and nightmare uh, and what we consider waking consensus, physical reality are destroyed for good. And that, you know, our reality, what we recognize as reality, our landscape is invaded by, you know, all these things that Lovecraft was kind of writing about. And, you know, and more sort of inserts plenty of his own. And, and you know, it sort of takes off on that whole thing. So basically what you're looking at is that, um, you know, Lovecraft is kind of an, like an antichrist in that um, he liberates and and change you know through through his writings through his works and and how they're absorbed and processed by the culture you know he liberates the prisoners of you know our our world but the prisoners of our world are not you know the poor and downtrodden masses the prisoners of our world are these nightmares yeah. and these nightmarish creatures and and just like just essentially dream reality itself the dream reality has sort of been kicking at the door you know through the surrealists and through psychedelia you know, and all, you know, back and forth in time and history, you know, Bosch, people like that. Um, but it finally, you know, the world becomes like a Bosch painting, you know. And it, it's kind of like, where is the lie? And, and maybe this is cyclical because all things are. Um, but there's a way you can kind of look askance at some of the stuff, say, Gary Luckman's been doing in the last few books about taking seriously the collective unconscious equals the spirit world idea and thus all these um, these horrifying notions being unleashed from from in our minds and and out into the waking world once again on earth, and so it, there's the delightful, glorious, um, psychedelic, as you say, kind of like Bosch surrealist, even Lovecraft. Some of the motifs are kind of really cool. There's like the good side of that, but there's also if that's happening, if you kind of if you open those floodgates, it all comes out, and 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 you see the kind of terrifying revivification of fascistic ideas and, and other things that are happening. And you think, all right. Again, Alan, where is the lie? I think this is a very good model for, for the spirit world's um, relationship to the waking world. Well, it's interesting. Can I get back to the invisible? So the invisible is, if, you know, it's a, it's a fantasia. It's a phantasmagoria. It's, it's clearly over the top in every possible way. But by doing so, you know, it, it does offer a pretty solid allegorical model of our reality. Oh, you know, God, yes. Particularly today, particularly today, right? So what more is done at the end of Providence, so I'm not exactly sure that things would ever sort of pan out the way they do in that, in no. that story. <laughs> but, I mean, just look at what's going on right now. I mean, all the certainties are being demolished. I mean, all the institutions, all the cosmologies, I mean, you know, our, our, you know, our faith systems, our philosophies, you know, people are just constantly kicking at the barriers and, and, and breaking the chains that um, maybe in some ways became calcified, some ways became oppressive. But, you know, we're put there in the first place to, to keep the excesses of human impulse in check, right? So, we're experiencing this. You're not in the way that it's depicted in this comic book, but we are 
we are seeing this. We are seeing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, you know, the certainties, you know, and there's almost a kind of um, a contrarianism, you know, if, if something was seen as, as moral, now it's seen as immoral. So, and that I think uh, he like, cause it's implied at the end of the book, at the end of Providence, that the, the the previous world is about to become the concealed or spirit world, and and the sort of concealed or spirit world, the 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 entities of the Lovecraftian thing, like that's going to become reality. So it's almost like they've won. It's an invasion, right? And and it's interesting, as you say, like it, for me, that maps to Charles Fort's idea that we're we're entering that dominant of wider inclusions, where it's not it's not a Kuhnian model where we learn more and we expand our sort of like floodlight of understanding just wider and wider and wider out into a dark universe. In, 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 the, in the Fortian sense, r- the rules of reality literally change in a, in a new dominant. And again, where is the lie? I, I think that's kind of what Alan is, is going with. Again, he's, I think he's describing his understanding, and I got this from you. Um, I may be mischaracterizing your words, but you can correct me. I think Alan is describing his understanding of, of magic by using this multi-layered um, and it's a spell, this multi-layered Lovecraft story. And, and it's a spell because it is, it is embedding it. It has portal points into reality and history by using real people and, and using names that reference other people in reality and, and, and whatever. It's, this, it's like, I, and here's where, because I have to do this thing that I do with um, Ursula Le Guin and Tolkien, which is I need to make them both my favorite. And, and in terms of graphic novel depictions of, of magic, how I've done that with Providence versus the Invisibles is that Providence is a absolutely deliberate, like you can almost picture him sitting down to a table with like a mug of coffee and putting the glasses on and going, and this is exactly what I think or how I think magic works. And that's Providence. Whereas the Invisibles is accidental because it's performative, but where, where I think it has the upper hand is in a way, you can make the case that they're sort of describing the same world, which is that our power structures and tyranny extend way deeper than you think into the imaginal or spirit world and get really fucking awful at, at, at the end point. You can kind of say that there, it's explicit in the Invisibles, not necessarily in Providence, but you could kind of make that case by maybe just bending it a little, right? Um, but what you get with the Invisibles is like what you do about it. Um, you, you, because that that sort of revolution and and pivot towards freedom and good is is individualized and eternal in in the in the context of of like this wider crazy psychedelic sort of spirit world thing. But that's I don't know. Let me know what you think about that because that's how I've landed. Which one of these is better at magic? Because Invisibles is better than Promethea, and I can't say the same. I can't say that Invisibles is better than, than Providence as a description of magic. Well, I just want to bring it back because there's um, something that's been a bit of a hobby horse for me, but it, you know, it obviously comes from some, from Lovecraft. So one of my favorite um, Lovecraft stories is the color out of space, which is now a movie. Uh, look, it looks like it could be good. Quietly confident. Yeah, I, I actually am too. Um, but of course the um, more famous uh, Lovecraft adaption was um, Annihilation. Uh, yeah, true. Fair year. enough. <laughs> um, and, and there's another girl in there. So, but I, I think that um, what Moore is depicting in Providence is really not that much different than what we see um, in inside the Shimmer with uh, with Annihilation. So, what what uh, if it, people haven't seen Annihilation, and I really recommend you do. So, um, the sort of alien. I don't even know, like a virus or some sort of organism, some sort of vector uh, crash lands off the coast of um, of Florida and begins, uh, you know, like a computer virus, uh, rewriting the code. You know, it's, it's rewriting the code of DNA and it's rewriting the code of DNA to suit its its own imperatives, and, you know, particularly that to survive. But it takes uh, the stuff. It takes the you know the basis, uh, the basic structure of of Earth life, and just it rewrites it you know to suit like, again to suit its own imperative to to to, to, to more accurately uh, you know become 
adaptive to to the environment that it that it's trying to create. So this is an alien invasion. This is an alien invasion that has you know profound and disturbing uh, implications for every for all life on Earth. Because what it is doing instead of you know landing in spaceships with ray guns is that it's just basically uh, invading at the cellular level. It's an invasion that um, targets uh, you know the building blocks of life rather than you know building blocks of buildings, right? So um, I think that this is um, so maybe less of a, a magical model, but. It feels to me, um, you know, that if this kind of invasion that that Moore is is depicting, taking off from Lovecraft stories and, and this filmic version, which is taken very clearly off the color out of space, you know, it would probably be more uh, in in real life would be more similar to what we see in the film rather than this comic book. But again, I think the two are just offering you know, like just slightly different lenses of, of the same reality. And it is, you know, it really is something that we're seeing um, maybe not as explicitly and not as extravagantly, but we are seeing uh, forces uh, you know, basically rewriting code, right? You know, uh, mm -hmm. we have things like CRISPR and so on and so forth, but we also have, you know, just... The, the the reality of uh, of algorithms and the reality of uh, of binary code um you know if if i was going to uh invade a planet maybe i would just send them binary code right <laughs> i mean it would it might take a little longer you know but you know if you're patient uh it, it would have basically the same effect i mean you know what's happening in our world today and you know, particularly when i i go into uh New York City, or you know, after you know, a particular couple of years ago, after not being there for a while, just seeing just how unfamiliar everything, you know, the landscape has been, you know, rewritten. It's been re, it's been redrawn. You know, the every, you know, the, it's constantly morphing and shifting. And now you have like all these electronic billboards where, you know, you can't even rely on like that static image because you're you're hit with a series of images. You know, like television everywhere you look. It reminds me of the Blade Runner movie. So, you know, we are seeing the same process um, take place all around us where, yeah, reality is, is being re rewritten around us. And, and maybe the microchip and the, and the binary code is some sort of otherworldly or other reality vector. Um, but either way, it's having the same effect. Um, yeah. You know, I know you agree with that. So, no, for sure. Absolutely. And, and all right. So, We've given people. So, so this is what I just want to say. Like, so this that's a much more pessimistic um, sort of denouement than what uh, is presented in the Invisibles or even Prometheus for that, you know, for that matter. But I think that it's probably a bit closer to what well, yeah. we're looking down the barrel at. You know, so, like I think um, yes, and and this would probably be maybe points for Providence rather than Invisibles in this sense. But I think it gets the eeriness. Um, Funnily enough, I think encountering the alien is better in Invisibles, but I think the general eeriness that sometimes goes, uh, well, often, if not every time, goes along with that, there's things getting closer to the surface, is, is, um, is better explored in Providence. But is there anything else, because we've given people a bunch to think with for um, both of these documents, is there anything else we want to say about that, um, either of them, kind of like in passing or in closing, I guess? Well, I know a lot of your listeners probably are not comics fans. So, um, you know, the one thing that I would just say is that uh, I think that Providence would be an easier read, you know, despite those blocks of handwritten <laughs> texts, you know, bookending book, book the, the stories. Um, the way it's laid out is much more cinematic. Um, Invisibles can be very, you know, even for somebody like me who's been reading comics for forever, 50 years, um, it, it can be hard to follow. Um, you know, the page layouts and uh, the balloon layouts and the narrative can get a little hectic and, and might be very difficult for a lot of people to read. Um, if, if you don't read comics, if you don't really care about comics, but you know, are interested in, in sort of immersing yourself in this magic reality and how to pick one 
I, I would go personally with Providence. Um, Invisibles is, is much more uh, a very potent artifact of its time, but it's, it remains an artifact of its time. Yes, more people than Chaos Magicians listen to the show, so that's probably that's a fair statement. They're both um, online versions of them are both linked up in the show notes, so if you've got the time, you can definitely do both. But as, uh, particularly if you are reading it on a screen, you're correct that if, if you're unfamiliar with um, comics, definitely start with Providence. Yeah, reading comics can be an art form, you know, uh, and particularly the way they used to be done. I mean, now today they're much more laid out like storyboards. But, you know, again, um, Invisibles is a challenge because it's not only the way it's, it's the story is told, but, um, you know, the story itself, it's, it's, it's a rocket ride. You know, it, it is, it's like, a, you know, a rocket fueled roller coaster because, Grant's got a lot of ground to cover (laughs) 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 and he throws it all in boy. I mean, everything gets name checked. I mean, you, you just take the, you know, take, um, uh, Eric Davis has a new book out called uh, high weirdness. Right. So I'm sure if you just took the, the, um, index of that book and cross referenced it with the invisibles, you'd find every single solitary term referenced in the invisibles. Cause you know, Grant's on a mission. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, sir, anything else, um, anything else we want to say, any announcements, anything we want to talk about before we wind it up and, and point people in your direction and you'll be able to include your Twitter handle because you use Twitter more and more, which yeah, delights me. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Ah, uh, yeah. It's the secret son speaks. And, um, I, I'm not sure when this is airing, but I, I do have uh, a book that I'm being, uh, that's being ready for publication that I'm extremely excited about. And, uh, Hope to, What's the uh, title? Back on. Where, where uh, are we the going? Is, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the book is entitled "He Will Live Up in the Sky." Uh, it's my first book in several years. It took five years to write, and uh, I'm extremely excited about it. And uh, it's very, very much influenced and inspired by people like uh, Grant Morrison and Alan Moore, for sure. I haven't finished it yet. I've been uh, reading it for people listening, and uh, and read it. Um, Unless it somehow gets really crap, um, that would surprise me. Um, what I've read so far, it's it's uh, you're right. It is very much inspired by like Grant and Alan and so on. It is a fucking uh, romp and uh, and and one that one that you want to kind of like shout along in agreement with. So um, well done. I'm looking forward to that getting in in people's hands as well. Outstanding. Nice one. Well, once again, always, always a pleasure. And, and I knew because by the time people are listening to this, if I haven't mentioned it in the opening, um, I will be away from the internet on a tiny island off another tiny island. And, and so I'm like, well, what can I do? What, can, what kind of value can I demonstrate to allow me to be away for a couple of weeks? And I'm like, I know. We'll do a marathon Chris Knowles show. So thank you for being so accommodating. <laughs> thank you for being so always accommodating. Always a pleasure. It's, it's a lot of fun. All right. Well, yeah, these are two very important works and, uh, you know, a lot of fun to talk about and uh, think about. All right. Well, we'll do this again soon. Very good. There you go. My, I guess my main goal for the episode was to have a comparison of, I guess, magic depictions between these two series. And I feel Chris and I achieved that. But as is often the case with Mr. Knowles, you also got way, way, way more. Uh, In this case, uh, we got a deep dive into the probably permanently unsolvable sea of creators and their creations and the impact of said creations on wider reality. Hopefully, that's Big enough and sufficient enough to tide you over for an additional week, as this episode is also next week's episode, meaning we'll be back on our weekly schedule for the last two weeks of November and right on through till Christmas. Until next time.